We are examining what Mr Johnson said to the House about gatherings in number 10. Whether what he said to the House was correct or not. Whether, and if so, how quickly and comprehensively any misleading statement was corrected. If a statement was misleading, we will then consider whether that was a genuine error or if it was reckless or intentional, and whether the record was corrected in good time. We have already considered evidence supplied by the government, including emails, WhatsApp messages, and photos taken at the time, and written statements taken under oath from witnesses present at the relevant times, to inform us of what Mr Johnson would have known at the time of his statements to the House. There has been much comment about whether the committee is relying on the Sue Gray report material. We are not relying on any such material, and nor will we. Last November, we decided to collect direct, first-hand evidence from all the witnesses under oath, and this has all been disclosed to Mr Johnson. Sue Gray is not a witness. We have followed the standing orders of the House and the precedents as advised by our clerks, by Speaker's Council and by Sir Ernest Ryder, a former Lord Justice of Appeal. We have not changed the rules or the procedure. That is not within our remit. They are laid down by the House, we are bound to follow them and that is what we've done. In our report of the 3rd of March, we set out the main issues which we will be asking Mr Johnson about today. We'll be talking about rules and guidance, since Mr Johnson told the House number 10 complied with both. When we refer to rules, we mean regulations laid down by the House, which have the force of law, and under which fixed penalty notices were issued. Guidance is guidance issued by the government. For example, when Mr Johnson was talking about hands, face, space, he was referring to the guidance on social distancing when he said space. On the basis of information that is in the public domain and evidence the committee has received, and in the context of what Mr Johnson said to the House of Commons, we will be establishing what rules and guidance relating to COVID were in force at the relevant time. Mr Johnson's knowledge of those rules and guidance. Mr Johnson's attendance at, or knowledge of, gatherings that were not socially distanced and those for which fixed penalty notices were issued. Mr Johnson spoke about the question of COVID compliance in number 10 in the House of Commons more than 30 times, most particularly on the 1st of December 2021, the 8th of December 2021 and the 25th of May 2022. I'd like us all to have a reminder now of some of what Mr Johnson said in Parliament in answer to questions, starting, if we may, with a question from the Leader of the Opposition on the 1st of December. As millions of people were locked down last year, was a Christmas party thrown in Downing Street for dozens of people on December the 18th? Prime Minister! Mr Speaker, uh, what I can tell the right honourable gentleman is that, uh, is that all guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10, but I repeat, Mr Speaker, that I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that, and that no Covid rules were broken, and that is what I have been repeatedly assured. I apologise. I apologise for uh, for the impression that uh, has been given uh, that staff in Downing Street take this less than seriously. Uh, I'm I, I'm I'm sickened myself and furious about that. Uh, uh, but I, I repeat what I have said to him uh, that the, that the, uh, that I have been repeatedly assured that the rules that the order, rules order, were not order, broken. Order. The Prime Minister has been caught red-handed. Why doesn't he end the investigation right now by just admitting it? Yeah. Because, Mr Speaker, I've been repeatedly assured that no rules were broken. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister tell the House whether there was a party in Downing Street on the 13th of November? Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, no, but I'm sure that it, and it, whatever happened, uh, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. And I'm happy to set on the record now that when I said I came to this House and said in all sincerity that the rules and guidance had been followed uh, at all times, it was what I believed to be true. It was certainly the case when I was present at gatherings to wish staff farewell, and the House will note that my attendance at these moments, brief as it was, has not been found to be outside the rules. But clearly this was not the case for some of those gatherings after I had left and at other gatherings when I was not even in the building. Thank you. We need to understand why Mr Johnson said to Parliament that no rules or guidance were broken in number 10 when we have evidence that he knew what the rules and guidance were and that he was present at gatherings where those rules and guidance were breached. We have yet to reach our conclusions in this inquiry and we will not do so until we have heard and considered Mr Johnson's evidence today. The evidence that we have already raises clear questions and this is Mr Johnson's opportunity to give us his answers. Will the clerk to the committee please administer the oath? Yes, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give for this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you very much. Mr Johnson, you provided the committee with a written submission which the committee has published. Do you confirm that the contents of that statement are true? I do. Thank you. Mr Johnson. Please make your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if I can, before I begin, I'm conscious that we're all expected to vote in a, a few minutes, uh, I think at 2.21. At um, I hope you don't mind if I resume. I mean, it will break up what I'm about to say. Well, we're a parliamentary committee, and Parliament is continuing. If there is a vote called, which we do expect, I will suspend the sitting to enable members to vote, and we can pick up from where okay. we left off. But thanks okay. for reminding okay. everybody that that's what's you, going to be Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair. Well, uh, as you've just said, there were a number of uh, days over a period of 20 months when gatherings took place in Downing Street that went past the point where they could be said to be necessary for work purposes. That was wrong. I bitterly regret it. I understand public anger, and I continue to apologise for what happened on my watch, and I take full responsibility. But as you've just said, Chair, the purpose of this inquiry is not to reopen so-called party gate. It is to discover whether or not I lied to Parliament, wittingly misled colleagues and the country about what I knew and believed about those gatherings when I said that the rules and the guidance had been followed at number 10. I am here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith and on the basis of what I honestly knew and believed at the time. When this inquiry was set up, I was completely confident that you would find nothing to show I knew or believed anything else, as indeed you have not. I was confident, not because there's been some kind of cover-up, I was confident because I knew that is what I believed, and that is why I said it. To understand why I believed it, you have to go back to a time before the Sue Gray report, before the police investigation, back to a time where, as the evidence before the committee shows, there was a near universal belief at number 10 that the rules and guidance were being complied with. That is the general belief that has been uncovered by your evidence. And it was that belief that governed what I said in the House. And as soon as it was clear that I was wrong, and as soon as the Sue Gray investigation and the Metropolitan Police investigation had concluded, I came to the House of Commons and I corrected the record as I promised I would. 
I clearly could not have anticipated the outcome by coming earlier because I genuinely did not know what the outcome would be and was deeply shocked when fines were issued, not least since I had been told on a couple of occasions at least by Sue Gray that she did not think the threshold of criminality had been reached. I believe that the committee's work helps to explain why I was so shocked. You've been investigating this for more than 10 months, and I thank you for what you have done. You have had access to a vast body of evidence. You have collected and reviewed hundreds of pages of transcripts of Sue Gray's interviews, and you have analyzed many thousands of contemporary emails and WhatsApp messages and other material. You found nothing to show that I was warned in advance that events in number 10 were illegal. In fact, nothing to show that anyone raised an anxieties with me about any event, whether before or after it had taken place. If there had been such anxiety about a rule-breaking event at number 10, it would unquestionably have been escalated to me. We all knew how vital it was to maintain public confidence in the fight against COVID, that we should do what we were asking the public to do. There's only one exception, of course, and that's the testimony of Dominic Cummings, which is unsupported by any documentary evidence and which plainly cannot be relied upon. He has every motive to lie. Not only has the committee found nothing incriminating, it has gathered a huge amount of evidence which demonstrates very clearly that those working in number 10 shared my belief that the rules and the guidance were being followed and that I received assurances that there was no rule breaking at number 10. The best and fairest course now would be for the committee to publish all the evidence it has assembled so that parliament and public can judge for themselves. Despite my repeated requests, the committee has refused to do this. As investigator, prosecutor, judge and jury, it has elected only to publish the evidence which it considers incriminating and not the evidence which I rely on and which answers the charges. And despite assurances that we would be permitted to add material that we rely on into the core bundle published today, late last night we were told that the committee was not willing to publish a large number of extracts which I rely upon in my defence. That is manifestly unfair. Instead, and in the absence of any evidence that I deliberately misled Parliament, the committee is trying to mount an argument that I must have known that the guidance was not being followed and that I buried, uh, buried in my head as we were fighting COVID was an unarticulated belief that even if we were following the rules, we were somehow failing to follow the guidance. And you have in your fourth report suggested that it must have been obvious to me because you have the photographs. So let me deal with this point head on because it is nonsense. These photos have now been churned through the media for more than a year and it seems to be the view of the committee and sadly many members of the public that they show me attending rule breaking parties where no one was social distancing. They show nothing of the kind. They show me giving a few words of thanks at a work event for a departing colleague. They show me with my red box passing on the way to another meeting or heading back into my flat to carry on working often late into the night. They show a few people standing together as permitted by the guidance where full social distancing is not possible and where mitigating measures are taken. They show events which I was never fined for attending. I know the public will have had the impression that these were covert photos with their sinister pixelations that have been in, obtained by the media. The vast majority were in fact taken by the official number 10 photographer. To say that we would have held illicit events in number 10 while allowing these events to be immortalized by an official photographer is staggeringly implausible. There are a couple of photos where the event is captured on Zoom as well as by the official photographer, which only reinforces the point. If we had an event that uh, we believed was illicit or unauthorized, why would we have it on Zoom when you never quite know who is on the other side? Most important of all, if it was obvious to me 
that these events were contrary to the guidance and the rules, then it must have been equally obvious to dozens of others, including the most senior officials in the country, all of them, like me, responsible for drawing up the rules. And it must have been obvious to others in the building, including the current Prime Minister. Order, order. We will now suspend the sitting whilst the House of Commons votes and we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Order, order. We will now resume this evidence session. Mr Johnson, would you like to resume your opening statement? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, the committee will remember I just made the point about the, the photographs and uh, I, I'd asked why on earth we would have held illicit or not, unauthorised gatherings in the presence of an, an official photographer. And I went on to say, most important of all, if it was obvious to me that these events were contrary to the guidance and the rules, then it must have been equally obvious to dozens of others, including the most senior officials in the country, all of them, most of them like me, responsible for drawing up the rules, and it must have been obvious to others in the building, including the current Prime Minister. On the contrary, the overwhelming evidence which you have assembled is that these individuals believed that the rules and the guidance were being complied with. And what is so telling is the number of officials who say the same thing and the total silence of the written or electronic record about concerns that anyone wanted to raise with me. It would be one thing if the committee had come here today and said, look, here are the emails or here are the WhatsApps that show that you were warned about rule breaking before you made your statements to the House. 
you haven't got any such evidence because that never happened. But if you now say instead that it must have been obvious that we were going against the rules and the guidance, then let's be clear about what you are saying. You're not only accusing me of lying, you're accusing all those civil servants, advisors, MPs, of lying about what they believed at the time to be going on. And as far as I know, you're not giving any of them the chance to explain themselves with their own oral evidence. I don't think you seriously mean to accuse those individuals of lying, and I don't think you can seriously mean to accuse me of lying. Now, everyone knows that there are some features of this proceeding that are extremely peculiar. I have the utmost respect for you, the Chair, but uh, you have said some things about this matter before reading the evidence, which are plainly uh, and wrongly prejudicial or prejudge the very issue on which you are adjudicating. I'm going to put your earlier remarks down to the general cut and thrust of politics and trust in what you have stressed at the outset, the impartiality that the committee insists upon and, and then insists upon in your report. The committee is in fact supposed to be inquiring strictly into what I said about rule breaking rather than non-statutory guidance, so much of this interrogation is theoretically irrelevant, but I'm going to take that in my stride because I, I, I agree with what you said at the outset. It is your job uh, in which I want to help you to understand why I said what I said to Parliament and whether I deliberately set out to deceive, and I emphatically did not. Your first concern is that I may have knowingly or recklessly deceived Parliament on the 1st and 8th December when I said that the rules had not been broken and that the guidance had been followed completely in number 10. When I said those words, I was not trying to cover up or conceal anything. I said what I said in good faith, based on what I honestly knew and reasonably believed at the time. That belief, what was in my head, was based on my understanding of the rules and the guidance. That did not mean that I believed that social distancing was complied with perfectly. That is because I and others in the building did not believe it was necessary or possible to have a two meter or one meter after June the 24th, 2020, electrified force field around every human being. Indeed, that is emphatically not what the guidance prescribes. It specifically says that social distancing should be maintained where possible, having regard to the work environment, and it is clear that in number 10 we had real difficulties in both working efficiently and at speed and in maintaining perfect social distancing. It's a cramped, narrow, 18th century townhouse. We had no choice but to meet day in, day out, seven days a week in an unrelenting battle against COVID. I had to call many meetings on the spot and to call a great many, uh, make a great many high-speed decisions. Yes, we certainly did have social distancing. We avoided physical contact. We gave way to each other in the corridors and on the stairs. We gave each other as wide a berth as we could. But it would have been impossible to have a drill sergeant measuring the distance between us all hours of the day and night. So, as the guidance prescribes, we had mitigations. When I spoke about the guidance being followed, I was thinking of all the things we did to stop the spread of COVID, given where we were working. We had large numbers of people working from home. We had many meetings, at least partly, on Zoom. We had limits on the numbers per room. We had sanitizer dispensers everywhere. We had signs on the walls telling you which way to walk. We kept windows open and we worked outside as much as possible. Because of the particular difficulties caused by the working environment, we had regular testing and a whole testing system was set up, I believe, on the third floor that went way beyond what was required in the guidance. So if you say, how could I stand up in Parliament and be so categorical about following the guidance, what was I thinking of? That is what I was thinking of. And I know you will, as you've just done, point to the, to the photos and then to the guidance and what I said. And you will say it must have been obvious that the guidance was being breached. But that is simply not true. My beliefs and my remarks to 
Parliament were indeed based on my knowledge of those events. But you have to understand how I saw them and what I saw during the period I was there. The vast majority of the events relied upon by the committee are events I attended for 10 or 15 minutes, perhaps a maximum of 25 in one case, to say farewell to a departing colleague. I know that people around the country will look at those events and think they look like the very kind of events that we or I were forbidding to everyone else. But I will believe till the day I die that it was my job to thank staff for what they had done, especially during a crisis like COVID, which kept coming back, which seemed to have no end, and when people's morale did, I'm afraid, begin to sink. But never mind what I think, the more important point is that the police agreed. They did not find that my attendance at any of these farewell gatherings was against the rules. I obviously did not know at the time that any of these events later escalated beyond what was lawful after I left. There is, of course, one event for which I and the current Prime Minister received fixed penalty notices. But it never occurred to me, or I think the current Prime Minister at the time, that the event was not in compliance with the rules and the guidance. At about 2.22pm on the 19th of June 2020, I went into the Cabinet room where I worked after getting back from a long external visit. I stood at my desk briefly before another COVID meeting began and had a kind of salad. A number of officials came in to wish me a happy birthday. No one sang. The famous Union Jack cake remained in its Tupperware box unnoticed by me and was later discovered and eaten by my private secretaries. We talked, as you would expect, about COVID and what we were doing to beat the pandemic. It is a measure of how innocent we thought this meeting was that an exaggerated, slightly exaggerated version was briefed to the Times with singing and cake eating, and yet nothing untoward was apparently detected either by the reporter or by millions of eagle-eyed readers. So when I spoke to the Commons, it did not for one second on the 1st or the, or the 8th of December, or at any time, it did not one second occur to me that this event the one, event, the one event for which I was fined would later be found to be somehow against the rules. And the same goes for all the events I attended. My belief was that we were following the rules and the guidance to the best of our ability, given the circumstances, and that was what the guidance required. You may now say that I was being obtuse or oblivious and that we should have enforced social distancing more ruthlessly. And we can argue that back and forth. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. We're talking about what I believed at the time. As for the event of the 18th of December 2020 in the press room, I was not there, but my honest belief uh, that it was within the rules was uh, based on what I was told by senior advisers. The fact that this was my honest belief is supported by the fact that so many other people honestly believed that we were doing nothing wrong. And it's abundantly clear from the evidence produced by the committee that everyone was operating with the same understanding of the rules and the guidance. If you want further evidence of what was going on in my head, look at the WhatsApp to Jack Doyle, where I positively urge him to get the truth out to the public, uh, the truth out about that December the 18th event. It seemed so unfair to me, based on what I had been told, that the event was being presented as a purely social gathering on what I knew to be a monumentally busy day for the media department, when they were coping both with the emergence that day of the Kent variant of COVID and what some saw as the risk of a no-deal Brexit. That was why I was inclined to believe that this event must be in line with the rules and the guidance. And that's why I said what I said on December the 1st. As for my statements on December the 8th, the committee is concerned that I may have misled the House when I said that I was repeatedly assured that the event was in accordance with the rules. I don't understand this point. You can see from the evidence that I received these assurances more than once and from more than one person. 
my statement was entirely accurate. The committee criticises the fact that I had not received assurances in relation to the guidance, but I never said that I had. I said what I said about the guidance based on my own experience and belief. The committee is critical of the fact that I did not receive assurances in respect of any other event, any event other than the December the 18th event, but I never said that I had. The, the committee seems at times to be saying in, in your fourth report that I should not be relying on the advice of uh, political advisers or even officials. This is ridiculous. I was the Prime Minister of the UK. I was trying to run the country during a pandemic. On the evening in question, 30th of November 2021, I was dealing with the emergence of the Omicron variant and the growing clamour for restrictions on another Christmas. I could not drop what I was doing, get up and go and institute a personal investigation into what sounded like a Daily Mirror try-on about an event that was now almost a year old. I had to rely on, and was fully entitled to rely on, what I was told by my senior trusted advisers. Government would be paralysed if ministers were not able to do so. Finally, the committee criticises the manner in which I corrected the record. I corrected the record on the day of Sue Gray's final report and six days after the completion of the police investigation. If the committee's view is that I should have come to the House and provided an inevitably incomplete account while a government or a police investigation was going on, including into events I hadn't even attended, I fundamentally disagree. At all times, I was entirely transparent with the House. I made it clear that I did not intend to comment on any of the factual matters until the investigation had been concluded. I kept the House regularly updated, and as soon as the investigations were complete, I provided a full correction of my honest but inadvertently misleading statements. I apologise. I apologise for inadvertently misleading this House, but to say that I did it recklessly or deliberately is completely untrue, as the evidence shows. Whatever we got wrong, I believe that officials in Number 10 and the Cabinet Office, and indeed all Whitehall departments, should be immensely proud of their efforts to protect this country from a loathsome disease. When I point out to this committee that this disease almost killed me, it's only to stress how seriously I took the measures we needed to stop it spreading, as I believe everyone did in Number 10, in Downing Street. It was those officials who organised and took the country through the lockdowns, which, whatever people may say about them now, were essential for public health. It was those officials who procured the vaccines that made sure this was the first country in the world to put an approved and effective vaccine in the arm of a patient. And it was those officials who helped mastermind the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe. It was thanks to those officials that we were able to come out of lockdown faster than any other European country with all the social and economic benefits that entailed. And still, to have a lower excess mortality or lower excess mortality rate than many other comparable countries. I am proud to have known and worked with those officials during one of the most difficult times we can remember. I am proud to have given them leadership. And that is what I believe I was doing at every one of the events in question. And I trust that the committee will be fair to them, fair to me, fair to the evidence about what we and I knew and believed, and conclude that I did not wittingly mislead the House of Commons, or, re or recklessly mislead the House of Commons, and that no contempt has been committed. Um, thank you, Mr Johnson. Before I turn to our questions, uh, there's one issue that you raised, uh, which your lawyers wrote to me about uh, on Monday, and which I've replied to you uh, this, on this morning about. Uh, you raised the issue of the importance of the committee being fair to officials, and we would very much agree with you about that. And that is why we're not content with putting into evidence interview notes that officials gave to Sue Gray until such time as those officials had a chance to check those interview notes and to agree whether they're accurate, and then they can be supported by a statement of truth, which is like an oath, and then they can be put into evidence to us. If you would like to uh, identify some officials and some aspects of the Sue Gray interview notes that you would like to then get 
under statements of truth and submit to this inquiry. The inquiry doesn't finish with this oral evidence session. You are perfectly at liberty to do that, and I would invite you to do that, and we can consider it. Um, we'll Thank you. I, 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 we'll I, I will do that. There are about, I think Thank there are about you. 16 points that we, we, okay. we wish to, uh, to elucidate, and... Um, uh, it would be helpful to do that. Okay, thank you. And we're putting now in the public domain your lawyer's letter to me and also my reply to you this morning so that people can be clear about that. We'll now begin our questions, starting with those which cover the six gatherings that the committee thinks are the most relevant to our inquiry. When asked in the House of Commons about gatherings in number 10 from December 21, 2021 onwards, you told the House that COVID rules and guidance were followed completely and at all times. Following the publication in May 2022 of the report which you'd commissioned into gatherings on government premises, you continued to maintain that it was certainly the case that the rules and guidance were followed at gatherings you had attended to wish farewell to staff who were leaving number 10. We will put to you what the COVID rules and guidance were on those six dates, what you knew about the gatherings that took place on each of those dates and their compliance with the rules and guidance then in force. We'll start by looking at two leaving gatherings that you attended in November 2020. We'll primarily be focusing on these gatherings compliance with the COVID workplace guidance in place at the time. These gatherings took place during a national lockdown in England. The legal rules in force to prevent the spread of COVID included restrictions on indoor gatherings of two or more people. The workplace guidance in force at that time stated that there should be social distancing of two metres in the workplace wherever possible and that only absolutely necessary participants should physically attend meetings. I will now invite Sir Bernard Jenkin to ask the first question. Sir Bernard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as the Chair described, we will first consider what knowledge you had of the rules and guidance um, in place at the time of each of the events you attended or of which you had knowledge uh, by reminding ourselves of what you were telling the country about the rules and guidance, and then we will ask about those gatherings. Now, you were aware of the importance of following the guidance the government had issued to keep workplaces safe. Indeed, you previously told the House of Commons on the 2nd of September 2020, and I quote, it's very important that we get people back into the workplace in a COVID secure way, unquote. And then on the 9th of November 2020, less than a week before the first of the gatherings that I will ask you about, you said at a COVID press conference, and I quote, neither mass testing nor progress on vaccines are at present time the present time a substitute for the national restrictions for social distancing and all the rest so it is all the more important to follow the rules unquote and at the press conferences over this period you regularly repeated the phrase hands face space while standing at podiums bearing this phrase so there can be no doubt that you understood what the guidance and rules meant and were intended to, to, to achieve yes or no yes thank you on the 13th of November 2020, uh, which we saw Catherine West just asking about on the film earlier, uh, there was an impromptu leaving gathering for your then Director of Communications, Lee Kane. This was held in the vestibule outside the press office in number 10. Between 15 and 20 people were present and you gave a speech. And the evidence for this is at page 9 of the evidence bundle. Do you accept that these facts are correct? Uh, yes. Um, we will now show the pictures, which you have made your comments about, but nevertheless we will ask you about them. Uh, the unpixelated photos are on page 540 and 580 in the bundle of the total evidence pack. The pictures show you with at least six to eight other people standing in close proximity. I want to ask first about this gathering's compliance with the guidance. You told the House of Commons as recently as the 25th of May 2022, uh, which was the day of the publication of the Sucre report, that it was, and I quote, certainly the case, strong words, that guidance had been followed at gatherings you attended to wish staff farewell, at least while yes. you were there. At least yes. while you were there. 
But the photographs show a lack of social distancing of two metres, which was required by the workplace guidance at the time. It was one metre we could So do you accept that you were present at this gathering and that people were not socially distanced while you were there? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir, Sir, Sir Bernard. Uh, I, I don't accept that uh, people were not making an effort to, to distance themselves socially from each other, and that happened uh, the whole time in, in Number 10. Actually, I think that the, uh, the guidance uh, by uh, November uh, 2020 uh, stipulated that you should uh, maintain uh, uh, one metre uh, social distancing uh, where possible, uh, with mitigation where two metres is not is not viable, and at, at all at all stages, the the guidance was intended to be uh, implemented where possible, and that is absolutely clear from the guidance. As I said in my in my introduction, uh, it was always the case that we understood that the uh, the confine the confines of number ten were going to make it impossible the whole time to enforce per, uh, total uh, social distancing, uh, as it were, with an electric force field around every individual. Now, this meeting uh, happened impromptu, uh, on an impromptu basis. It had to happen. Uh, it happened because uh, on November the 13th, two senior members of the... And people will ask, you know, why was this happening? Why was it necessary? Uh, it was necessary because two senior members of staff, uh, the... Uh, effective chief of staff and the director of communications had both uh, left the building or were about to leave the building in pretty acrimonious circumstances or what were potentially acrimonious circumstances. It was important for me to be there and to give reassurance. And the, the salient point I would uh, venture to make is that following that gathering, no fine was issued to me. My presence there was felt by the uh, by the Met to be uh, not to be unlawful. Uh, they agreed that it was a work-related event, and I, I believe it was absolutely essential for work purposes. Right. Well, I'm asking about the guidance at the moment. Yes, and, and I'm telling you that I believe the guidance okay. no. is was a, uh, so. What, what you've got to understand: when I looked at that group, it did not for one second occur to me that we were in breach of the guidance given the logistical difficulties we faced okay. in number 10 and the need to have urgent meetings such as this. Um, I mean, you said, uh, you didn't quite answer my question to begin with because you, you suggested that the picture doesn't show that people weren't making an effort to comply with the guidance. I'm just asking whether the evidence is that the guidance was being complied with. And I think by I believe suggesting... That, I, that believe they, that they, that, that, I believe that the guidance is being complied with. Right, OK, because I'll come to that because... Um, uh, it, uh, it, it must have occurred to you that given that they weren't social distancing at two metres uh, that they might have been in breach of the social distancing guidance either while you were at the gathering or while ref or indeed as you reflected on this afterwards as the storm broke around your head you must have been thinking well I wonder whether that was really complying with the guidance that must have occurred So Bernard I, f forgive me but it, the, I, I've got to correct you on, the, on a point of uh, a technical point uh, after June, uh, 20, uh, June of 24, 2020, uh, the guidance was changed so that uh, the objective was to maintain uh, social distancing uh, at, uh, uh, with, at one metre with mitigations where two metres were not viable. I'll come to that. I'll come to that. But I think the point, the first point is that it's fair to say that you didn't say that we did every effort to comply with the guidance of the House of Commons, and you didn't say... No, I'm saying that we followed the guidance completely. No. Because you can't... You, you, okay, the, right. We'll come to this in a minute. Okay. But you, you, can't, um, you can't expect uh, human beings in an environment like uh, Number 10 uh, to have, as it were, a um, invisible electrified fence around them. They will occasionally drift into each other's orbit. When I saw that, it did not mean to me that we had breached the guidance. It, means, it, meant, it meant that we were following the guidance to the best of our ability, which was what the guidance provided for. And the guidance provides for uh, freedoms within the, the practical framework of the operation or the business uh, to decide how you're going to implement the guidance. Uh, the, the measures that you referred to at the outset uh, are things that need usually uh, to be complied with. Uh, there were, businesses are entitled and asked 
to decide what practical considerations they wish to give to implementing uh, the guidance. And, and, and that, is what we, that is what we did. Can I just say, do people understand why I believed, because this is the crucial thing, if I may say so, why I believed when I stood up on uh, December the 1st that the guidance was followed completely at all times in number 10, what, what picture I had in my head and why that doesn't conflict with that, uh, that picture. Uh, the answer is that I knew from my direct personal experience that we were doing a huge amount to stop the spread of COVID within the building. Uh, we had sanitizers, we had uh, windows were, were, were kept open, we had people working uh, outdoors wherever they could, we had Zoom meetings, we had restrictions on number of people uh, in rooms, we had perspex screens uh, between desks, and uh, above all, as I said, we had testing, regular testing, which went way beyond what the guidance prescribed, and which in my view helped mitigate the difficulties we had in maintaining perfect social distancing. Right. I'm bound to say that if you'd said all that at the time to the House of Commons, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, but you didn't. Um, and the question is that um, the question is about what the guidance actually says. And um, I, I notice you taking a little advice at that point on the question of the guidance. Can I just read to you, on, it's on uh, page six of the bundle, what the guidance actually says. You must maintain social distancing in the workplace wherever possible. Where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in, full in relation to a particular activity, the businesses should consider whether that activity be redesigned to maintain a two metre social distance or one metre with risk mitigations where two metres is not yes. viable. And the mitigations, mitigating actions include using screens or barriers to separate people from each other. So where in the picture is there, are there screens or barriers? So the, 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 there were screens or, or barriers in the, uh, I believe, in the adjacent uh, press so room from, in, not here. from memory. Well, well, this is, a, this is a, 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 an, an impromptu gathering at which I'm thanking staff, uh, a, 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 at least one member of staff, for his contribution uh, during COVID. Uh, I believe it was an important part of my job to do that. Uh, that was the best place to do it. I accept, I accept that perfect social distancing, uh, Sir Bernard, is not being observed, but that does not mean that what we were doing, in my view, is incompatible with the guidance. The guidance specifically allows uh, for, for workplace freedoms to decide how to implement it, and, it, and the, the, op the operative conditional is where possible. Now, do not for one moment believe that people in number 10 did not operate social distancing because they did, and they took great effort, they made great efforts, in my, uh, in my view, to my memory, to, to, to stay apart from each other. But that didn't mean that they, they were able to stay apart from each other the whole time. That's what I'm saying. Well, that nobody, did not conflict nobody, with the nobody guidance. Is, nobody is devaluing the efforts of anybody in number 10 during the COVID, including you, by the way, um, and the public service you gave during your period as prime minister during the pandemic. All we're asking is to, I'm afraid, it's our obligation I'm trying to explain to you, no, no, you why you I said I'm that the guidance was question. followed. I'm halfway Please. through a question. Um, all I'm saying is that we've got to find out, establish in our minds, uh, whether what you told the House of Commons was strictly accurate. And uh, the, the guidance goes on to say, where social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full, even through redesigning a particular activity, business should consider whether that activity needs to continue for the business to operate. And if so, take all the mitigating actions possible to reduce the effect, the, the risk of transmission between the staff. Now, nobody is disputing that it's the right thing for you to thank your staff. The question is uh, whether what you said about this particular way of thanking your staff in the House of Commons was strictly accurate. Um, and indeed, may have been misleading. That's what we're asking. Well, I, I, and, don't, and, I don't believe for a second this, that it was. The guidance does not say uh, you can have a thank you party and there's many people can, in the room let, let, let's like, just, okay, let, if you think it's very important to thank people. The guidance doesn't say that. Let's just, let's just, let's just go, go, go back over, uh, uh, over that. Uh, I, I, I believed that this event was uh, not only reasonably necessary, but it was essential for work purposes for the reasons that I have, I have given. Uh, the, I've described the constraints in which we were operating in number 10. Uh, if you wanted to have a, uh, a rapid gathering to thank people, this was the place to do it. Uh, there aren't, in fact, that many people 
uh, there. I, I accept, though the pixelation makes it difficult to, to work out uh, exactly who is, uh, who is where. I accept that uh, perfect social We've distancing. We've got the unpixelated is, 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 is You've not, got the sure, unpixelated Sure, photographs. but the public can't see that. Yeah. The public can't see that. Yes, but that's Bernard. not. A... I, I accept that uh, not everybody is perfectly socially distanced in that picture, but that did not mean to me. Right. When I stood up in the House of Commons, and said that the guidance was followed completely. I was not thinking of that event and thinking that somehow that contravened the guidance. Absolutely not. Okay. We, were, we were making a huge effort to follow the guidance. That was my memory, and that is, that is why I said what I said. This is exactly the purpose of this session, that you can make the case that you're making. Can we move on to examine the compliance with the COVID rules at this gathering? Uh, uh, as we heard in the clips earlier, you told the House the rules were followed at all times, so you must have thought the gathering was reasonably necessary for work purposes, as was then required by the regulations. We know that the gathering attracted fixed penalty notices. Uh, so, in fact, the police have judged that it broke the rules. Why did you think it was within the rules? I thought it was essential for work purposes, or reason, at least reasonably necessary for work purposes, because for the reason I've, I've given Sir Bernard, that uh, we, November the 13th was a day in which uh, two senior officials, in those senior advisors in government, uh, had, had left their jobs in very, very difficult and challenging circumstances. And it was necessary to steady the ship. It was necessary to show that there was no, uh, no rancor, uh, that uh, the, the business of the government was being carried on. That's what we had to do. That's what I had to do. I, I know that, but it's, it's what you said about it to the House of Commons is what matters. Um, we know it was a leaving event for a member of staff. The photographs we've just seen yes. do not seem to show any actual work being done. Uh, why did it not occur to you that it at least might have been in breach of the regulations, or at least because it was not reasonably necessary for work purposes? What, what, what did, did you say, did it occur to me that it might not be reasonably necessary for work purposes? Yes. No, it, it didn't occur to didn't me occur to for you. one second okay. that it wasn't reasonably I mean, necessary for work what, purposes. To do it in that particular and, way and, and then say that particular thing about the way that event was actually carried on. And I, I really, you know... Uh, to this day, and uh, as, I, as I said earlier on, I, I struggle to see how I could have run uh, number 10, run hundreds of officials uh, who needed to be thanked and appreciated for their work uh, in very uh, trying circumstances uh, without having uh, brief farewell events of a kind that, uh, at least insofar as my participation was concerned, did not fall foul of the rules. I just remind you of that key point about that event. I was not. Uh, I, was, I was there for a maximum of, of 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I think. Uh, I gave a, uh, a, a short speech. Could I cut in at What this I point? did was not found to have been in, Johnson, in breach of the rules. Could I cut in at this point? Because how long you were at the gathering is not a question no, I understand that, Mr. that. Jacob, I understand that, that Sir yeah. Bernard is asking you. And while I'm interjecting, you raised the question of imperfect social distancing. Um, Social distancing, hands, face, space, which is the space part, is either two metres at this time, or it's one metre with mitigations. Two metres where Bernard, possible. Two metres. Two metres where possible. Two says. metres or yeah. one metre with mitigations, which is screens. It doesn't say one so, metre where possible. So, so, it doesn't say that. It, it, so what, the objective of social distancing is, is to maintain social distancing wherever possible. That's so what it what says. So what is the notion of a less than perfect, an imperfect social distancing. Yeah, because you were telling yes. the country to do social distancing. Yes, but, but so did we in number 10. And, uh, but I'm sure, by the way, that, that uh, up and down the country, in spite of people's uh, ob observance of social distancing, uh, there were times when people drifted within uh, one or two metres of, of each other. That, that is, I'm afraid, just inevitable. And uh, we had a particular problem in number 10 because, as I uh, said earlier on, we had to call meetings at great speed. Uh, we had large numbers of staff that had to come into the building uh, because we needed to uh, get a variety of, uh, of opinions, even though we had loads and loads of people also on, on Zoom. And it was not, we had, we had as, 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 a, as, as you know, because you've been to, to look at it. Uh, we had lots of higgledy-piggledy uh, 
corridors where uh, it wasn't and, and, and spaces where it wasn't always easy to maintain perfect social distancing. That did not mean to, like that space there, that did not mean to me... about we, higgledy piggledy corridors. If you could just refer yourself to Sir Bernard's next question, which is course. about mm. an event. Um, there were lots of people leading critical organisations around the country and um, a leaving due for everyone else around the country was not acceptable under the guidelines um, all the rules. So why was it acceptable and necessary for work purposes in number 10? Thank you, Sir Bernard. Well, I, 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 look, I, I, I want to repeat what, what I said at the beginning. I understand that people looking at that photograph will think that it looks like uh, a, uh, a, a social event. It was not a social event. I was, if anybody thinks that I was partying during lockdown, they're, they're completely wrong. That was not a party. I was there to. I haven't said it was a party, Mr. Johnson. Well, you did actually earlier on. Uh, I, 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 what I, what I, what I was doing was thanking staff or thanking one individual in particular for their contribution, and uh, I believe that was my job. Um, so, if you'd been asked at a press conference with your podium saying "hands face space," whether it was okay for organisations to hold unsocially distanced farewell gatherings in the workplace, what would you have said? I, I would have said that it's up to organisations, as the guidance says, to decide how uh, and they are going to implement the guidance, uh, amongst which is, of course, social distancing. Uh, where they can't do social distancing uh, perfectly, they can't maintain two metres or one metres, then they're entitled to have uh, mitigations. And that's what the guidance says. And we did indeed have plenty of mitigations, including, and uh, as I've said to you before, uh, I, this was exceptional, in, uh, in number 10, we had a great deal of, of testing. So the answer is you would have said it was OK? No, I, I, I said the answer is that you should do what the guidance says. And the guidance says that where you, where you put in mitigations, uh, where, you, where you do what is uh, possible, uh, then, uh, and where you follow social distancing in, in a way that, is, uh, that reflects the realities of your workspace, uh, that will be in compliance with the guidance. That was my view. And I think that's what everybody else understood. Well, Certainly that, uh, and just, uh, sure. can I repeat this point? This is what everybody understood, I believe, in number 10. Uh, it's for a long period uh, of, of 20 months of the struggle against COVID during which we were having, uh, as, as the Prime Minister himself has said, describing the experience of walking into uh, loads of, of rooms and finding lots of people there. Uh, it was simply part of, of working in number 10 that we were going to be, come into contact uh, with a great number of, of people. But people did follow social distancing and they, they were acutely conscious of it. I now turn to the 27th of November 2020. This was another unplanned leaving gathering for a different special advisor that again took place in the vestibule outside the press office in number 10. And we have three witness statements attesting to a lack of social distancing at this event. Uh, we've got, uh, and this is on page 17 of your witness bundle, uh, we've got Jack Doyle, who was your press secretary at the time and subsequently your director of communications, saying that there were certainly more than 20 people in attendance. And do you accept that? I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I wasn't at that event, and it wasn't an event that was found to have been in breach there, of the rules. There's no reason to dispute it. Well, I, I, I happen to know, because we, we've all seen the same evidence yeah. uh, bundle, though I think this, actually this is one of the things that you have, uh, that we, we haven't been allowed to point to. I think there is, I think there is evidence uh, from at least one of the, uh, of the participants that uh, there, there, were, there, were, there, there weren't that many uh, people there, and it lasted a very, uh, a very short time. Well, by, uh, by all means, make sure that's drawn to our attention. Oh, sorry. Sorry, this is the clear event. Uh, sorry. Sorry, you mustn't mention any names. I think, I think, I think that name, that name we, we can mention. Um, that, that, that event, uh, my memory of that event, uh, forgive me, I was at that event, but I was there very briefly. I was going to correct you. I, thank, I, you thank you. Correction. Sorry, I was at that event, but I was there very briefly. Uh, no no uh, fines were, were issued for that event. Order, order. I'm afraid we have to suspend the committee again. There's a division in the Commons. We'll return in 15 minutes.
now resume this evidence session. Sir Bernard. Um, just on one point, you, you were quibbling about um, the meaning of the guidance, which does say wherever possible, but not in respect of less than one metre where mitigations are obligatory. Uh, that's not wherever possible. It doesn't say mitigations wherever possible. They are essential if you cannot do two metres, and we couldn't see any uh, mitigations in the photographs. Well, also, also. Um, um, sorry, 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 Sir, Sir Bernard, if I, if I, if I may. Uh, the, the, what the guidance says, as far as I can, uh, I can see, is it, it, it ensures workers maintain social distance guidelines of two metres. Uh, or one meter with risk mitigations, where two meter is not viable, wherever possible. Uh, um, well, actually, then that, so that that conditional wherever possible governs both two meters and one meter. Okay. Well, we, we will address that point in our report. We will take consideration of what your and, 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 about and the that. next. And but the, I don't think we agree with your interpretation of the guidance. That uh, it, well, uh, but anyway, let's can, can I say whatever your th so, this is a very important point no, I because whatever whatever your interpretation of the guidance may be, what matters, if I may respectfully say is what I believed to have been our efforts to follow the guidance, why I thought that they were credible and, uh, and wholehearted, Parson, and what I was thinking I of at the time I spoke. I ask you to allow Sir Bernard to ask his next question. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, we were talking about the three witness statements uh, or about the 27th November 2020 event, which was a leaving event for another special advisor in the vestibule number 10, where there were certainly more than 20 people, um, and I think you accepted that. Um, and you, that, Sorry, um, I, I, can I come back on that? Okay, certainly. Uh, I think the, the, there's conflicting evidence on that point. And right, if, you okay. look at, if you look at what Sue Gray has to say, she says 15 to 20. Um, um, but we're not relying on Sue Gray's evidence, isn't that ironic? Um, the, um, <laughs> so, um, so, so are, you, are you saying that that evidence is invalid? No, I think that any evidence collected by Sue Gray has to be independently verified with a statement of truth, which is why we can't publish the evidence, the, the material which you've given us, which has not been accepted. Perhaps it would be helpful if I gave my evidence about, uh, well, about that. No, well, I think it would be very helpful if there anything in Sue Gray's witness statements uh, that, that were collected in the interview notes I, would I, be dealt with separately as the chairman described I think it would be helpful if Sir Bernard was enabled to ask his question and you would give a succinct answer. Mm. Right. So on, you'll see also on page 17 of your bundle that another witness state, stated that they couldn't get through the room to leave because people were standing four to five people deep. Uh, is there any reason why we should disbelieve that? Well, uh, the... I've seen that I've seen all the testimony about this event, and there's testimony from uh, there's the Sugre evidence that I've, I've mentioned, uh, and it seems quite incredible to me that we now can't uh, adduce uh, what she had to say after extensively interviewing people. She said there were 15 to 20 uh, people uh, she thought at that event. Uh, it's also the case that the that the person who was leaving on that occasion. Uh, Cleo Watson, I think we can we can name her uh, according to my uh, understanding. Uh, she said uh, that it was a, uh, a, a a clutch of officials and that it land uh, that it, it it lasted a very short time indeed. And she and she said I think that there was a um, a speech by me that lasted 45 seconds and a speech by her that lasted 15 seconds uh, from from memory. Um, I was certainly there very briefly. Indeed, and to get to your point, Sir Bernard, the the quotation that you have about that event uh, does not actually accord with my my own memory. Which quotation uh, is this? Uh, uh, the four to five people deep right. and, and more than twenty people in, in in attendance. I actually remember quite a. I, I, my my memory of the event is much more in line with what Cleo Watson has to say and what Sue Gray had to say about the event. Okay. Um, finally, you will see on page 20, on 17 of your bundle that another witness said that you joked during the gathering that it was, and I quote, probably the most unsocially distanced gathering in the UK right now, unquote. Uh, at paragraph 63 of your evidence, uh, your written submission, you do say that you don't remember saying that, uh, those particular words, but are you therefore denying that you said this? I don't remember saying those words, and I think it unlikely that I would have said those words, given what I've had to say to the committee just now, 
about my memory of the event. When I, when I, my visual memory of the event is that it was much more as Clear Watson describes. Uh, it was a, a clutch of people around that table, the same, the same table that you've just uh, been looking at. I don't remember people being four or five deep. I don't remember saying okay, that. Well, but but what I will question. say... Look, I'm sorry, you're giving very long answers and it's taking longer than we need and please. you're repeating yourself quite a lot. Can we just get on with the questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so you, you're actually not denying you said this, but you're, you can't recall saying it. That's what I think it's unlikely that I said yeah. that. But you that also doesn't mean I didn't say things okay, about social you. distance. You've answered the question. You also state in your um, written submission of paragraph 63, and I quote, that you might well have made observations in speeches about social distancing, unquote. So what sort of observations? I might well have made observations about the importance of social distancing, since it was very much on our minds. Right, okay. But how right would it be to conclude that you can't be sure what you, that you, you did not comment on the lack of social distancing um, and at this or any of the other gatherings you attended? Because otherwise, why would you have raised it? I'm sorry, I don't even understand the question. Well, I'm, I'm just <laughs> you, you're not denying you might have said that, that what I read out. I think you're you're unlikely, you I think it's unlikely, like that. given the, unlikely. the number of people that I, but that I remember seeing. It. I think it's unlikely, right. given the number and of people so it I saw. It would be quite fair to conclude that, um, uh, that you did comment on the lack of social distancing at events. It's quite fair. It's to certainly conclude. likely that I would have drawn attention to the importance of social distancing, since that was yeah, but why very high in people's minds. To the importance of social distancing if everyone was obeying social distancing. Because obviously, it seems because as, as, as we've just extensively discussed, mm -hmm. the, there might be occasions when uh, people gathered together at high speed and um, where social distancing was imperfectly observed. Well, well, that did not mean that I thought the guidance was not being followed, but given all that I've said earlier about observing social distancing where possible. Well, you do accept that the evidence we have uh, under statement of truth um, that uh, indicate that those who were at this gathering very clearly indicate that there was insufficient social distancing at this gathering. You do accept that? I, I say that I, some of them do, some of them, some of them don't. Um, and you've established that you were familiar with the social distancing guidance, you were at the gatherings, there was a lack of social distancing, um, so it must have been, yes, obvious to you at the time, um, and even more obvious on reflection afterwards, as this whole thing broke around you, that it was in breach of workplace guidance relating to social distancing? No. What? Uh, no. Uh, that, that's not correct. What I thought was that we had done our uh, best to implement the guidance and, in fact, had thoroughly and completely implemented the guidance, but uh, clearly, uh, when it came to things like social distancing, uh, as the guidance explicitly provides for, it was not possible at all times to have perfect social distancing. And, and that you could have mitigations. But um, as recently as the 25th of May, you said it was certainly the case, 25th of May 2022, last year, it was certainly the case that social distancing, social distancing guidance was being respected at all times. But I think you're now saying it was imperfect. Sorry, I'm, I, what I'm trying to, the, the, your, there's a confusion between social distancing and the guidance. The guidance comprises social distancing amongst other things. And what we were trying to do was follow the guidance to the best of our ability. That meant uh, that sometimes uh, social distancing could not be perfectly observed. There were other mitigations we put in place. The guidance also said that only necessary part participants should physically attend the workplace meetings. Absolutely necessary participants. It said so you, when you usually, these, usually. It said usually. When you, when you attended these um, events, uh, when you didn't even know who was attending, how were you so certain that everyone there was absolutely necessary to attend these events? Bernard, uh, these events were, uh, of course, not organised by me personally. Uh, I relied upon uh, my excellent officials to make sure that we had the right people in the room. Thank you, Mr Thompson. Okay. okay. Thank you. We'll now move on to examine two gatherings that took place earlier in 2020, both of which you attended, Mr Johnson. We'll look at the gathering which took place on the 19th of June 2020. This was a gathering in the Cabinet Room to mark your birthday. 
We'll also look at the gathering that took place on the 20th of May 2020, which was a gathering for staff in the Number 10 garden. Yeah. The legal rules in force to prevent the spread of COVID varied between May and June 2020, <coughs> but at both times the relevant rules included restrictions on gatherings of two or more people. The workplace guidance in force at that time stated that there should be social distancing of two metres in the workplace wherever possible and that only absolutely necessary participants should physically attend meetings. I'll now invite Yvonne Fauvarg to ask our questions about these gatherings and I would ask if you could, because we've already covered quite a lot of ground, if you could answer as succinctly as possible. Of course, because I may be repeating what I need to say. Thank you. Mr Johnson, before I ask my questions, can we again confirm your knowledge of the rules and guidance in place at the time by reminding ourselves of what you're telling the country. You told the House of Commons on the 11th of May that, and I quote, if you must go to work and cannot work from home, you should do so provided that your workplace is COVID secure and that you observe the rules on social distancing. We are publishing further guidance on that. You also told the House on the 11th of May that people should be limiting contact with others and keeping your distance to two metres apart where possible. That was just a week before the gathering on the 20th of May. And then on the 10th of June, just over a week before the gathering on the 19th of June, you said at a COVID press conference, I quote, I urge everyone to continue to show restraint and respect the rules which are designed to keep us all safe. So please, to repeat what you've heard so many times before, stay alert, maintain social distancing and keep washing your hands. You agree that those were the rules in force at the time? Yes, thank you. Let's turn first to the gathering of the 19th of June 2020, where breaches of both the COVID rules and the guidance are an issue. We'll show pictures of this gathering on the screen and the unpixelated photos are on page 359 and 414 in bundle one of the total evidence. The pictures show that you attended a gathering in the cabinet room on this date to mark your birthday with at least 17 other people in attendance. Now the attendees included your wife and your interior designer, didn't they? Uh, they, they certainly included my wife and son and yes, there was a contractor who was working in the building who popped her head round the door very briefly. So there was your wife and, and your interior designer were present and you were issued with a fixed penalty notice for this event. And you've just confirmed that at least two people attended who were not work colleagues. Why did you think this was reasonably necessary for work purposes, as was required by the rules at the time? Well, this was an event that uh, took place, uh, as you say, on my birthday. I'd come back from a long uh, external visit. I thought it was uh, reasonably necessary for for work purposes because I was standing at my desk surrounded by officials who'd been asked to come and uh, wish me a happy birthday. I'd only recently recovered from uh, an illness, uh, from COVID, and it seemed to me to be uh, a perfectly proper thing to do. We were about to have another meeting and, th and they were very largely the same officials. And presumably your wife and the uh, contractor were not attending that meeting. It is one of the peculiarities of number 10 that, my, that the Prime Minister and uh, his family live in the same building. And uh, it, it, my understanding of the rules is that uh, the, the Prime Minister's family is entitled to, to use that building and use every part of that building. Turning now to the guidance in respect of that event, the COVID workplace guidance then in place said that workplace meetings should be socially distanced and only attended by those whose participation was absolutely necessary. Now, the two pictures we see on the screen show the gathering wasn't socially distanced, and it was attended by people who were not absolutely necessary to be there. So would it not have been obvious to you that the no. event was in breach of the and guidance? No, and it's a measure of how unobvious it was to me uh, that this was any kind of breach at all, that... Uh, we actually, or the press office, actually publicised this meeting in the Times newspaper, briefed it out, as I said earlier on, with a slightly embellished account. 
I can, I, I, I'd had absolutely no sense while this event was taking place, and indeed uh, later on, at any time, that this event was in contravention of either the rules or the guidance, nor did anybody, before I spoke in the House of Commons, suggest to me that it was. And I think that the then Chancellor, who also received an FPN, would have been just as surprised as I was. So you didn't reflect on the event afterwards as to whether it was in both rules and guidance before you spoke in the House of Commons? No, I, I didn't. And, uh, th and that's because it was a long time ago. I'm afraid it had entirely slipped my mind. And I thought it was a, a completely innocent event. It was a very brief event. Uh, I'm, I'm standing at the desk, I, uh, at the, the place I uh, would have normally sat. Uh, it did not strike me as being anything other than an ordinary common or garden workplace event. So can we now turn to the 20th of May 2020, and that was a gathering in the number 10 garden for staff. We've evidence that you were present at this gathering while you were there. There were up to 40 people also there. And at this time, a gathering had to be essential for work purposes to be within the regulations. <clears throat> now, we've got evidence that the email invitation for this gathering, which was sent by your principal private secretary, Martin Reynolds, was sent to 200 odd people and that it encouraged staff who attended to bring their own alcohol. That's on page 35 of your bundle. Did you see the invitation email at any time before it was made public? No. You didn't see the email itself, but were you aware that the email was sent to 200 on people no. and invited staff no. to bring their own alcohol? So what was your understanding of the purpose of the gathering? To thank staff for who'd been working very hard on COVID, and uh, it seemed to me, and I, I think I was told about it only shortly before it, uh, before I was ushered out uh, into it. Uh, the purpose of it was to uh, to thank them in an, in a uh, obviously a, a ventilated area, in the garden. So, did you discuss the purpose of the gathering with any officials before it took place? Yes, I think I would have been told. Um, I mean, I don't remember it, but I think I would have been told. Uh, the, the, some, the COVID uh, team is gathering outside. Uh, it's been a very tough time. Uh, this was a day when the uh, cabinet secretary had just uh, stepped down. Uh, I think the civil servants needed to feel that, as I said, in respect of another event, uh, that the business of government was being carried on. And they needed to be able to feel thanked and motivated for their work. And that's what I did. Are you were aware of the gathering before it took place? Uh, briefly, yes, but I, I think I, it was you know, one of those uh, uh, things where, as I think Sue Gray may point out in her report, I don't know what value we now attach to it, uh, but uh, when you're Prime Minister, you, you move around quite rightly, your, your officials uh, give you uh, the, the next thing to do and you go and do it, and this was, this was the next thing to do. I then went and had a, a telephone audience with, uh, with Her Majesty. We've evidence that some officials and advisors felt the event shouldn't go ahead. On page 34 of your bundle, your then Director of Communications, Lee Kane, describes the tone of the email invitation as clearly social and in breach of COVID guidance, and says he raised concern about it with Martin Reynolds. Another official gave us evidence saying, and I quote, I heard there were so many people who were unhappy about the party that they were not going to go, and they themselves said to another official that they thought it was madness. That evidence is on page 38 of your bundle. Mm. Were any concerns about the gathering's compliance with COVID rules or guidance raised directly with you at the time? No, and uh, the individual that uh, you mentioned who raised concerns, uh, Lee, uh, uh, was, if you read what he says, he was, he was concerned about the optics, not about the rules, and uh, he himself attended uh, the event, and certainly no, no concerns were raised with me. The event had been within the rules. Why was he concerned about the optics? I, I think, I, I can't say. I think he was concerned about the impression that uh, people might gain if they looked over uh, the garden wall, if they were coming from the, uh, the, the media uh, room and, and thought that we were doing something that uh, other people weren't allowed to do. And I, I, in my opening um, remarks, I made clear that I, I can see why people might have felt that way. But I, as I told the House... Uh, when I came to report on that event, uh, I, I still believe it was within the guidance and within the rules. 
So did Lee Kane discuss or raise concerns about the gathering with you at the time? And no. his, his evidence suggests he might have done. He said, I quote, I don't recall if I personally had a conversation with the PM about the garden party, but it would have been highly unusual for me not to have raised a potentially serious communications no. risk with the PM and, directly. And, and if he had thought, and, here's, and if he had thought, and if Dominic Cummings had, had thought that this thing really was against the rules and should not go ahead, uh, they would have told Martin Reynolds, and it, it is inconceivable that it would have gone ahead. Did Martin Reynolds discuss or raise any concerns about the gathering with you at the time? As it, again, his evidence suggests to us he may well have done. He said it's possibly raised concerns with you. Uh, no, not that I can remember, no. Were you otherwise aware of any concerns from what you've heard or read either before or after the gathering no. took place? No. As I, as I told the House of Commons, about, and I, I gave a, quite a long series of remarks about this event, when I walked out into the, into the garden, it seemed to me implicit, it was implicit in what we were doing that this was a work event. As we'll see from pages 34, 40 and 41 of your bundle, we have evidence that trestle tables were set up on which alcohol was laid out, and that the attendees included your wife, as well as advisers who were not from Number 10, but from other government departments. Did you see that when you were at the gathering? Uh, I had no hand in organising this when you talk about uh, trestle tables and, uh, and so on. Not it was... I, 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 and there's, there's no me, prohibition. Johnson, Sorry. I ask me, if you would, is that she was not asking whether you organised the trestle tables with the alcohol on right. it. She was asking whether you saw the t trestle tables with the alcohol. I did see. I did see. I don't remember uh, what exactly was on the trestle tables. Uh, I I remember going around and thanking staff for what they were doing during COVID. Now it is perfectly possible that my wife was in the garden as well, but she is was entitled to be there. And I don't. Uh, she certainly didn't receive a fixed penalty notice uh, for that event, nor did I. You'll also see from page 34 of your bundle that Lee Kane said he briefly attended the gathering and that in his view it's clear from observing it that it was a purely social function. Did you share that view? Uh, no, and that's certainly not what he said at the time. Uh, but if he thought that it was purely social and therefore against the, the rules, it is inconceivable that it would have gone ahead. The Metropolitan Police have confirmed that fixed penalty notices were issued in relation to that gathering, so we know it breached the COVID regulations. We know that you knew what the regulations were, and we know you were in attendance. So it would have been obvious to you when you were there that the gathering was not essential for work purposes and was partially a social event, wouldn't it? No, and I, I actually, I, if, I'm, if I'm in great respect, uh, Mr Pervarg, I, I want to dispute the idea that it was... Uh, not an essential gathering, or not a gathering that was reasonably necessary for work purposes. I don't know why the FPNs were issued, but it may be that they were issued uh, to people who uh, had uh, not a good enough reason to come in from home uh, to that gathering, or, or people who had come uh, from elsewhere to that gathering. But uh, my, uh, my firm impression, I think it's certainly still the case that uh, Martin Reynolds believes that that gathering was within the rules and indeed within the guidance. Would you have advised anyone else in the country if they'd asked you at one of the press conferences at that time to have a large social gathering in the garden? It, I, it was not a large social gathering. It was a, it was, it was a gathering intended, and I really must insist on this point. People who say that we were partying in lockdown simply do not know what they are talking about. People who say that uh, that event was a purely social gathering are, are quite wrong. My, pu my purpose there was to thank staff, to motivate them in what had been a, a very difficult time and what was also a very difficult day in which the Cabinet Secretary had just resigned. Did you think, Mr Johnson, that exceptions applied in Number 10 to workplace rules and social distancing guidelines no. that didn't apply to the hospitals and the care homes? Workplaces that were also operating under incredibly different, difficult and challenging circumstances? Of course not. And uh, th that's why we continued, that's why we had all the stipulations that I've discussed at, at great length with Sir Bernard about, uh, about following the guidance. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I'll now hand back to the Chair. Thank you. Um, 
To complete this section of our questions, we'll look at two gatherings that took place at the end of 2020 and the start of 2021. The first we'll look at took place on the 14th of January 2021. That was a leaving gathering for two officials held in the pillared room of number 10. The next one we'll look at was a Christmas gathering in the vestibule on the 18th of December 2020. At the time of both gatherings, the legal rules in force to prevent the spread of, alcohol, spread of COVID included restrictions on gatherings of two or more people and workplace guidance stated that there should be social distancing of two metres in the workplace wherever possible and that only absolutely necessary participants should physically attend meetings. I'll invite Alan Dorrance to ask you about these gatherings. Mr Dorrance. Thank you. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr Johnson. Um, Mr Johnson, before I ask my questions, can we again confirm your knowledge of the rules and guidance in place at that time by reminding ourselves of what you are telling the country? You told the House of Commons on the 2nd of September that it was very important that we get people back into the workplace in a COVID secure way. This shows you're aware of the workplace guidance and its contents. Then on the 9th of November, you said at a COVID press conference that neither mass testing nor progress on vaccines are at the present time a substitute for the national restrictions for social distancing and all the rest. So it is all the more important that we follow the rules. In addition, at a press conference on the 30th of December, you outlined a tier four restriction which were enforced in London. A fortnight later, when the 14th of January gathering took place, you said the restriction meant not meeting up with friends or family indoors unless they are in the same household or support bubble and avoiding large gatherings of any kind. My first question to you, is that your understanding of the, the rules? Yes, thank you. Thank you. My, my first question will concentrate on the gathering of the 14th of January 2021. This was a leaving event for two officials held in the pillar room at number 10. We have evidence that approximately 15 people attended. We will now show you a picture of this gathering on the screen. The unpixelated photo is in page 757 of bundle 2 of the total evidence. Here we see the, the picture on, on the screen, Ms Johnson. The photograph shows yourself and at least other people 11 other people in attendance in the unpixelated picture. The Metropolitan Police have confirmed fixed penalty notices were issued to some individuals who attended this gathering as it breached the COVID regulations in place at the time and was not reasonably necessary for work. This breach of the COVID rules would have been obvious to you when you were there, wouldn't it? No, I, I, I must respectfully disagree with you very strongly. Uh, Mr. Dorans. Uh, on the contrary, what I see there is, and, and I, I know that there's a, uh, some some bottles on the on the table, uh, but you have there a. And you're, you're looking actually. I think that's a Zoom. That's somebody. That's somebody. A screenshot taken from from Zoom. I would guess because you've got people uh, at this event. A large number of of the people uh, were actually on Zoom. You've got people who work with each other every day who use that. Uh, <laughs> room for meetings and who are meeting briefly to say thank you and, and farewell to I think two talented uh, young uh, officials I, I think Malcolm Reed and Alex Burns uh, was the was the was the occasion um, and uh, it was the sorry forgive me I shouldn't I shouldn't I shouldn't mention the, the names of the, of, the, of the officials I've said they're talented uh, but anyway uh, uh, those two those two officials were uh, uh, leaving and it was my job to thank them and to show that their work was appreciated. Uh, I was there very briefly, I didn't receive a, an FPN. There's nothing I can see, and I've got to tell you this, there's nothing I can see in that uh, photograph that strikes me as being either against the rules or the guidance. And I, I, what, I actually, what I actually see, and, and depending on how you your, your perspective is what I actually see is is people trying to stay reasonably far apart from each other. That's that's what I see. Now I don't know what happened later on, uh, but I can tell you that for the period I was there, it seemed to me to be wholly in accordance with the uh, the rules and the guidance and a, 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 a proper use of my time, even if it was only brief. 
Would you agree with the description of the gathering we received in evidence from an official who attended and who described the gathering as not strictly an event about work? This statement is on page 47 of your evidence one note. Well, I, 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 I don't agree with that because I think that it was essential to thank staff throughout the, the pandemic. There weren't very many of these occasions. Uh, when, they, when they occurred, I thought it was right and proper for me to, to motivate staff by saying how we were doing and to thank them for what they'd done. It wasn't just the staff who were leaving who needed to be appreciated. It was the staff who were there who needed to be motivated. Thank you. The picture shows uh, this gathering and it appears to show multiple bottles of alcohol in the bottom right-hand corner of the, the photograph. Would you say that that is strictly necessary for a work event? It's, it's customary to uh, say farewell to people in this country with a, a toast. Uh, I didn't see any sign of, of drunkenness or, or, or excess and uh, had no knowledge of, I, I don't know why uh, anybody would have been fined for that event. I don't know what, what happened later on. Okay. Uh, the next gathering we, we want to ask you about is a gathering on the 18th of December 2020, which we know was not compliant with code regulations, as some attendees received fixed penalty tickets, fixed penalty notices. This gathering was a pre-planned press office drinks event with cheese and wine, and was widely reported in the press. We have evidence that it was attended by between 25 and 40 people. You'll find the relevant statements on page 54 of your evidence bundle. Your official diary confirms that you were in 10 Downing Street that evening. Did you at any time join this gathering? No. 18th of December. I'm no. sorry? The 18th of December 2020? Yes. No, absolutely not. No. Okay. Um, your official diary on page 56 of the evidence bundle shows a gap between the hours of 1917 and 2024, and I appreciate this is difficult, but can you confirm where you were at that time? Uh, I imagine I was working, I think from, from memory, there was a, this was, this was an evening when we were dealing not just with the emergence of the, uh, the Kent variant, uh, with, with, with Delta I think it was, uh, but also with a great deal of anxiety about uh, whether we were going to have a, a no deal Brexit. I, I thought that anxiety was unfounded, of course, uh, and, and we didn't. But it was a, a very long and very difficult evening. I think we had a, an extended COVID-O COVID -O, uh, session, but I certainly did not attend that event and have, had no direct knowledge of it. OK, thank you. We, we conducted, the Privileges Committee conducted a visit to Ken Downing Street, as, as, you, as you know. Uh, we established, you can clearly see from the suppressed vestibule, where this gathering was taking place, from the bottom of the stairs leading up to then what was your flat in, in Downing Street. Your diary says you went to your flat at 21.58. Apparently the gathering went on until after midnight. Is your evidence that you did not see or hear the noise of a gathering of about 25 to 40 people taking place in the vestibule room? The vestibule, when you were going to your flat. If we just perhaps explain, there is a corridor, a narrow corridor, leading to the vestibule. Before you get to it, the staircase on the left leads to your flat. Your direct line of sight would be into the vestibule, not more than a few metres away. There's a gathering taking place with between 25 and 40 people. You had clear direct line of sight of that, that room. Are you telling me that your evidence is that you're not aware of the noise or the, the event taking place? I, absolutely, and all I, what I, look, what I would have uh, if, I, if I had looked, uh, what I would have seen, I'm sure, uh, was people doing a huge amount of work to, on a very, very busy evening. Now, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't look, I certainly have no memory of, of seeing any kind of um, party or, or uh, illicit gathering going on in the press room on that evening. The first, I, the first I heard about this thing, the first I knew about it, was when... Um, it was brought to my uh, attention by Jack Dorr, I think, almost, almost a year later. Thank you. Mr. Jones, if you turn to pages 54 or 56 of your evidence bundle, you will see that this gathering was described in evidence we've received as beyond desk drinks and far more relaxed than it should have been when people were shoulder to shoulder with each other and that one number 10 staff member who did not attend said they later heard that the gathering had turned into a party. Did anyone tell you about that? 
Well, the, the, no, they didn't. And this is the crucial point. Nobody raised the, uh, any anxieties about that event with me uh, before I stood up in the House of Commons. Nobody said to me that we, oh, we, we've had something, uh, that uh, we've done something that in, in, the, in the almost a year that followed between uh, December the 18th, 2020 and 30th of November uh, 2021, uh, when Jack Doll came to see me, the thing was a complete blank to me, right? Uh, the Metropolitan Police have confirmed a fixed penalty notice were issued to some attendees at that gathering. Clearly, the effort breached the rules. There are no witnesses to say that you were at the gathering, but did anyone make you aware at the time or after it happened that it had not been compliant with COVID rules? No. Thank you. Uh, Mr Jones, before we move on to discuss what you said in the House about gatherings in number 10, you will know that fixed penalty tickets were issued in relation to gatherings in number 10 on two other dates. Uh, other than those we've asked you about. These gatherings took place on the 17th of December 2020 and the 16th of April 2021. This is confirmed by the Metropolitan Police Statement at the end of Operation Hillman, which you'll find a copy of on page 89 and 91 of your evidence bundle. Did you ever have any reason to think that COVID rules may have been broken at this gathering on either of these dates prior to 2021? Uh, December 2021. So, so which, which dates, forgive me, uh, Alan? Uh, so 17th, 17th of December and the 16th of April. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember um, uh, hearing. So I, what, I, what I can tell the committee is uh, none of these, I was conscious of none of these events as being uh, in any way rule breaking or against the guidance until stories started to emerge about them, and that was after I had spoken in the, uh, in the Commons about them. So they weren't, they weren't at all on my radar as things that, we, that I should be concerned about. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jones. i hand you back to the Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, we've now considered the rules and guidance relating to COVID that were in force at the time of the gatherings we've discussed with you. We've considered your knowledge of the rules and guidance then in force, and we've considered your attendance at a knowledge of gatherings that were not socially distanced and for which fixed penalty notices were issued. We, we will now compare that with what you said to the House of Commons after media reports of these gatherings began emerging. We'll concentrate particularly on what you said to the House on the 1st of December and the 8th of December. We'll first examine your assertions that COVID rules and guidance were followed in number 10, and I'd like to invite Andy Carter to ask our questions about this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Johnson, um, on the afternoon of the 30th of November, I understand the Daily Mirror contacted the press office at, at Downing Street saying they were planning to publish an article alleging that events had taken place in Downing Street in November and December 2020 where COVID rules had been broken. Now, the article appeared online later that day, and uh, it was the paper's front page splash on the 1st of December. And I think uh, you can see a copy of that on page 58 in your evidence bundle. Um, I'm guessing you must have known that you would be asked about this at Prime Minister's questions in the House of Commons uh, the, the following day, the, 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 um, the 1st of uh, December. And sure enough, you were. You were asked whether a Christmas party was held in number 10 on the 18th of December, and you told the House all guidance was followed completely in number 10. Picking up on the things that you've said in your opening statement and the evidence that you've given, you knew what the guidance was, i.e. maintaining social distancing wherever possible, uh, and ensuring mitigation was in place if, if that wasn't possible, and you knew there had been gatherings where social distancing hadn't necessarily been maintained and where masks, for example, weren't being worn. Uh, and uh, screens weren't in, in place, because we've seen some of the, the photographs there. Um, so why did you tell the House all guidance was followed completely in number 10? Thank you. So I, I'm not certain that there was any, just quickly, I'm not certain there was any requirement for masks uh, I indoors. It's part of uh, mitigation. Uh, oh, I see, I'm with you. Okay. So uh, the reason I said that all guidance was followed completely in, in number 10, and you know, to, back to Mr. Mr. Dorans and the general, the, a lot of the questions that have been raised, between the, the, the event that took place and when I stood up to, to speak, in, in all the cases that, I, that, uh, that you mentioned, nobody came to me and said, 
uh, we've got a problem with this one, uh, you, need to, you need to worry about this. And I want you to, I want you to, and there's no trace of that in the written evidence or in the, uh, in the electronic record. And that is a very extraordinary thing, uh, given how serious that was. The reason I said what I said uh, was because uh, I thought, uh, I believed then uh, that the whole of the number 10 team were doing a huge amount to follow the guidance. And uh, I, I talked to Jack Doyle about what had happened uh, at that event. This is on the evening of the, the 30th of November, uh, 2021. And it's about, uh, I'm not, my diary says it was about six o'clock. Uh, he comes in and uh, he says that, the, the, as you say, the Daily Mirror is going to run uh, this story. Uh, he mentions a few other uh, events, um, two of which I, I knew directly about and knew that there was no, uh, as, I, as I believed at the time, I knew that there was no issue uh, with those. Uh, the other was something, I, I think there was something to do with a, an event at, at CCH, a conservative central office, so I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, I asked him about this December 18th event, and I, sa I asked him to describe it. And bear in mind everything I've said about that evening, which was a, a horrendously busy and difficult evening, and we'd had a long uh, COVID over to discuss what to do uh, with, with the Kent variant. Um, he told me that it was within the rules. Uh, he said that people were sitting at their desks, uh, drinking, uh, admittedly, but that was not banned. That was under any of the uh, either the rules or the or the guidance. It was not uh, prohibited, and it was regular. I'm afraid for for people to uh, to drink at uh, on Fridays. Um, and I concluded that it sounded to me as though that event was within both the rules and the guidance, and that fortified me in, in what I stood up to say the following day. Uh, as it happens, when I said the guidance has been followed completely during number 10, which is actually what I said, um, I, I was misremembering the, the line that had already been put out to the media about this event, which was COVID rules were followed at all times. But you've got to understand that I didn't think that there was any real distinction from the public's point of view between the rules and the guidance in the sense that or, or our observance of, let me put it this way, I didn't think that the public would make any, they would expect us to follow the guidance as much as, uh, as the rules. Can I, can and I so that's why, and, and so even though I, I'd said something slightly different, I still believe it was true. Can, can I just, if, if you said something slightly different, can I ask you, why didn't you correct the record then? Because that would have been an obvious thing to do. No, and, okay. I, and I understand the point you make. There is confusion between guidance and, and rules. But you but could, I, have, I you could have corrected you. the record at that point. But I, 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 I didn't think there was any appreciable difference because it was our job to follow the guidance as much as to follow the rules. And uh, my view, as I've, as I've said repeatedly to the committee this afternoon, is that I believe we were following the guidance. And in spite of the, uh, the pictures that we've all looked at, which, uh, which seem to show a lack of perfect social distancing, I believe that what we were doing was in conformity uh, with the rules, for the, certainly it was for the period I was there. And I believe that the beh behavior was reasonable uh, given the constraints of the building, and therefore in accordance with the guidance. So that's why, what, I said, what okay. I said. I know you didn't attend the, the gathering on the 18th of December. You, you, you've just been, been very clear about that. Um, but you have attended some of the other gatherings that we, we've talked about. Um, and you've just said that you asked uh, Lee Kane, Mr Kane, about the gathering on the 18th. So why didn't you tell the House uh, at, at that point um, when you were asked uh, that there were some of the gatherings in number 10? Uh, I told, uh, I said so it was Jack Doll. I'm sorry, continue, Jack Doll. But, but, um, but because, and the, you know, this goes to the, the heart of what we're trying to establish, I didn't think that those events were an issue. Nobody had previously raised them with me as being things that I ought to be concerned about. And they didn't, and... As I've, as I've said re repeatedly to, the, to you at the, at the time, call me uh, obtuse or oblivious, but they did not seem to me to be in conflict with the rules or the guidance as we were trying to implement in, in number 10. Okay, uh, the, the next Prime Minister's question was on the 8th of December, a week, a week later. I think it probably would have been fair to say that you would have guessed that 
the topic would have been brought up again by the, the leader of the opposition um, because uh, the previous evening ITV had published a video of a mock press conference where number, st number 10 staff were, were seemingly joking about the gatherings on the 18th of, of December. Um, at PMQs on the 8th of December, you were asked if there was a party in number 10 on the 13th of November, and you told the House the guidance was followed and the rules were followed in Downing Street at all times. By the 8th of December, it had been a full week since you were first asked in the House about gatherings in number 10. The issue had continued to feature on the front page of many of the newspapers and, as we later saw on, on the television, what did you do in that week to prepare for any further questions about gatherings to decide whether you needed to correct your previous statement that the guidance had been followed and whether you should reaffirm it? Well, I did, I, as, the, as the committee knows, uh, I did the most, the, 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 the most obvious thing, which was uh, when the, the Allegra video uh, emerged on the, uh, the evening of, I think, the, uh, the 7th of uh, uh, December, I uh, decided that I was getting conflicting information about what had happened at this gathering on the 18th of December. Um, I was troubled by that. I hadn't been at the thing. I was relying on uh, what I thought were the honest and well-intentioned uh, descriptions of this from uh, my, uh, my um, trusted advisers. But clearly there was a difference of opinion. So uh, I commissioned the Cabinet Secretary to conduct an inquiry. That's the most important thing. Uh, that I did. By the end of that Prime Minister's questions on the 8th of December, you've been asked, I think, multiple times about the issue of gatherings in, in Downing Street, but at no point did you tell the House that you knew that there had been gatherings that you had attended, in particular the five we've raised with you. Why did you fail to tell the House on the 8th of December that there were gatherings that you'd attended? But, but Mr Carter, you've got to, you've got to understand that uh, in my mind at the time, these did not seem to me to be improper or, or offensive events. So they, they, I, they did not, they weren't in my consciousness because I... You thought they were work the events? I, 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 I thought they were work events. As I said to the House when we came to discuss the May 20th event, and I came to the House uh, to explain, uh, I, I made it very clear that I thought that that was a work event, and indeed I still do. Okay. Having told the House on the 8th of December that the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times in Downing Street, you then reiterated this the following month. You told the House of uh, Prime Minister's questions on January the 12th. I believe that the events in question were within the guidance and were within the rules. You knew what the rules and guidance were, and you personally attended at least four gatherings, those of the 20th of May, the 19th of June, the 13th of November, and the 14th of January 2021, for which fixed penalty notices were issued to attendees, which hadn't been compliant with the rules and at which breaches of the rules and guidance must have been obvious to you because no. you were there and you no. saw... So, so, no. Uh, so the, uh, the only FPN that I received uh, was for the event that I, uh, we, we've been over in some detail, which was the, 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 the event in the Cabinet Room. And I think that uh, even this committee, I, 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 you know, I venture to suggest, might concede that had they been in my shoes uh, at that event, it might not have occurred even to them uh, that this was a, an event that was against either the rules or the guidance. It certainly didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to the then Chancellor of the Exchequer. It didn't occur to the media department. We, we briefed that. That was, only, that was the only event for which I received an FPN. All the other events, uh, for the period I was there, I can only conclude were deemed by the uh, Met to be not rule-breaking events because I wasn't issued with an FPN. Therefore, you have two sets of events. The one the, for which I received an FPN, which boggled my mind because I couldn't understand why I got it, and, and the others uh, where I, I wasn't aware of rule breaking at the time and believed we were following the guidance. So there was nothing I could say to the House on that score. If you turn to page 61 of the evidence bundle, you can see a statement there from the then Principal Private Secretary Martin Reynolds in which he says that he directly questioned with you whether it was realistic to argue that guidance had been followed at all times in number 10. Do you accept that you were advised not to say guidance was followed at all times in number 10, and yet you told the House that it was on the 8th of December and the 12th of January? No, so on the, so there's a couple of, of, of important points. Uh, it, it is absolutely true that Martin Reynolds 
uh, was cautious about what I should say in the House on the 8th of December because we'd already begun uh, the process of the inquiry. We were looking at the, uh, the December the 18th event. Uh, I had received assurances about uh, the rules on December the 18th, but I hadn't received assurances about the guidance. What, what Martin was trying to get at, uh, if you look at his, uh, what he says, it's, it's clear. He's talking about uh, social distancing and whether, it was, uh, whether we had maintained social distancing within uh, number 10 and whether that would, uh, that would be, uh, whether we had maintained perfect social distancing within number 10. And if you look at uh, paragraph, um, if you, I, if, hang on a second. Um, Martin makes it clear that uh, he thinks that the nature of the working uh, environment in number 10 uh, might make it uh, difficult to claim that full social distancing uh, was observed. That, that, so, forgive me, just, Chair. Just spend while the bell's ringing. We don't need to vote, but sorry, okay. continue. Can I, can I just, just it's, a very, again. it's a very, very important point, because this goes to the heart of, I, I think, the confusion. Uh, and, and what we're... Really okay. we're in, in his comments to me, Martin is, is talking about whether or not we observed perfect social distancing. He is not saying that we did not observe the guidance. And I can prove that if you just reflect for a second on what it would mean if he had said that throughout the pandemic we were not observing the guidance. He didn't mean that. Uh, he and I were responsible for making sure that we were observing the guidance to the best of our ability. He, if you'd asked Simon Case or any of the senior officials, uh, were we following the, were, were, put it the other way around, were you flouting the guidance in number 10? They'd have said no. We were following the guidance, but with mitigations uh, and uh, with um, uh, social distancing where possible as specified in the guidance. On reflection, and, and given that Mr. Reynolds says that you agreed to delete the reference to guidance. Do you wish you'd have corrected the, ref the, the record at, at that point? Uh, no, because uh, uh, first of all, we'd already begun the, uh, the inquiry and I, I, it was, I, didn't know what to, I didn't know in what sense the guidance had been uh, broken. I, didn't know, I, didn't, I had no evidence that anybody had, had broken the guidance. It wasn't clear to me what I would say uh, to the House of Commons. Um, second, nobody, had, nobody was advising me to... Uh, to correct uh, the record. And um, Martin and I, as I've tried to explain, were talking about two different things. I was talking about uh, a, the totality of following the guidance. Uh, he was talking about maintaining perfect social distancing. Uh, the advice that he was giving me was in relation to a statement that I was making about the uh, December the 18th event and about the reassurances I had received. And it was true to say that I'd received reassurances about that event uh, on, as far as the rules went, uh, but it was also true to say that nobody had explicitly reassured me about the guidance. And he thought it prudent to take out the reference to the guidance. I th it, it is true, as you, as you just said, Mr. Carter, that I then went on to, later in PMQs, to talk to Catherine West. I don't know whether it was going to come to this point. but. Uh, she asked a, a question, and uh, as, you, as, you've, as you've said, I said that the, uh, she asked a question about whether there had been a party on November the 13th. I said no, but I was sure that the rules and gui guidance had been observed. Uh, what, I said no, but whatever happened, I was sure that the rules and guidance had been observed at all times. And, and I, I, I said that with confidence, because I knew about the events she was talking about on November the 13th and had my own personal reasons to believe that that was true. Uh, in your um, written statement to us, paragraph 81 two, uh, you say you don't believe that perfect compliance with social distancing was required by the guidance. If you believe this, why did you not make it clear when you told the House that the guidance was followed at all times? Well, that's a very good question, uh, Mr Carter, and uh, perhaps it would have been... Um, Perhaps that would have, uh, uh, as, as I think Sir Bernard said earlier on, um, perhaps if, if I'd elucidated more clearly what I meant and what I felt and believed about uh, following the guidance, 
uh, that would have helped. Um, probably final question. Paragraph 28 of your submission. You quote an excerpt from the workplace guidance which says uh, where the social distancing guidelines cannot be followed in full in relation to a particular activity, business should consider whether that activity needs to continue for the business to operate. And if so, take all the mitigating actions possible to reduce the risk of transmission. Are you saying you thought these gatherings were so critical to the function of government that it was permissible to hold them even if they couldn't be socially distant? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I thought that it was essential to thank staff for their work. Uh, I think that it, 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 even though the, the pictures seem to show uh, festive events, I think that our efforts, even in those pictures, are being made to, uh, to do social distancing. And what I saw and what I had in my head when I was talking to the House of Commons was a memory, a strong memory, of uh, people over a long period doing uh, everything they could to stop the spread of disease within the building. And, and just so we're clear, um, at those events in the vestibule, the first pictures we saw, what mitigations were put in place that were required by the guidance? So uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I've listed some of them, but uh, we, we avoided physical contact. We, we didn't, for instance, as the guidance says, we didn't touch each other's pens. Uh, we didn't pass uh, stuff to, to each other if we could, if we could possibly uh, avoid it. Um, we kept, we kept, the, you know, not every, I, I, wouldn't, I would not wish to say that that was perfectly implemented. Presumably people were passing drinks to each other because we've seen the picture. Uh, of course, and I, I'm not, and this is guidance. <laughs> this is guidance. And I'm not going to pretend that uh, it was uh, enforced rigidly, but that's ex explicitly what the guidance provides for. Uh, we had Zoom meetings, we had a great reduction in the numbers of people in the, in the building overall. Uh, we had signs telling you which way to, to walk. Uh, we had perspex screens. And I, I've mentioned all this before, but it's worth, it, it really is worth going over again because. It's asking you about that specific event. It, when, you, when, you see the the December the 18th event. when you see the photographs in the vestibule, none of those mitigations seem to be evident. Yes, because it, so which event are you talking about, Mr. Carter? So the, the first photographs that we saw. Yes, um, okay, the, the, the November the 30th, the Lee Kane event. Yes, and th that is because uh, that was the, the space where people congregated fast. Uh, if uh, I wanted to get a message out, it was the, the natural place to, to do it. Uh, yes, you don't see... Um, you, you don't see... Um, uh, perspex screens there, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't uh, sanitizer uh, and uh, efforts to, to 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 restrict the spread of COVID. Final question for me. You, and, and just just as a, 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 you know, just in all of this, bear in mind that we believed, Martin Reynolds believed, everybody responsible for the health of the building and the health of employees in the building believed that the uh, guidance was being very considerably augmented in a way that went beyond the guidance, by the testing regime that I've, I've described. I, I don't think any members of this committee don't recognise the challenges that you were facing, the team were, were facing in Downing Street, and uh, the, the steps that were being put in place to try and keep people safe. I, I, I do, though, want to just finish, if I may, with the, um, the comment that you made to the House on the 12th of January, that you believed implicitly that the gatherings of the 20th of May, which you attended, had been a work event. That yeah. was the event in, in the garden. I mean, yeah. it's being termed, it was termed in the press, the bring your own booze. <coughs> it was a garden party. Um, many are suggesting that was clearly not essential for work purposes and they're therefore in breach of the, the COVID rules at, at the time. Why did you say that to the House? Because I, I, as I, I implicitly believe that it was a work event. And as I said to, you, to the committee just now, I was, I was ushered out into the garden, having been briefed uh, shortly beforehand about what the event entailed. Uh, I, I met and thanked various groups of people who had been working on COVID. You see the numbers are calculated at between 10 and, and 30 or 40. I, I, I couldn't say exactly how many were there, but it was, I thought, an appropriate use of the, of the garden. Uh, and I felt it was a, a, an obvious work event. But what I said to Sue Gray afterwards, if we can, if we can mention, uh, Sue Gray, Cammy Chair. What I said to Sue Gray was that um, 
when I looked back at that event, and this is what I, this is what I, what I, what I, what I said to, is why I said what I said to the House. You know, I, I tried to put myself in the in the in the place of somebody, a member of the public, looking over the garden wall and seeing that, and I had to accept that even though it was, I believe, within the guidance and within the rules, I have to accept that members of the public looking at it will have thought that looks to me like something that he's not allowing us to do. And I felt that very keenly. In, in retrospect, I didn't, but the, 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 I didn't feel it at the time. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I understand that. Uh, can, I, can I ask you one further question? I, I think probably all MPs that have been on, um, on, on days where we're very busy going from meeting to meeting rely on our advisors to guide us through where we're going. I understand what you said about that as the Prime Minister working on a busy schedule. Did you at any point question any of the events that you were going to when the advisors were taking you to them? I look, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, in retrospect, I, I might have thought about uh, some things, you know, post post Sue Gray, post the, uh, the the beginning of the of the uh, of the coming to light of everything that uh, did come to light. I, I have thought about it, but um, no, at the time, I thought we were working. I thought we were working, and that is what, I promise you, that is what officials uh, in Number 10 thought w they were doing as well. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. Um, can we now turn to the issue of the assurances that you uh, mentioned to the House on numerous occasions, and I'd like to ask um, Alberto Costa to ask you uh, the committee's questions on the issue of the assurances. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much for coming before this important inquiry. I'm very grateful. Could I invite the team to place up slide number eight, please? Mr Johnson, as we've just seen on the screen, on the 8th of December 2021, in your opening remarks at Prime Minister's Questions, you told the House that, and I quote, I've been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. In response to subsequent questions, you said that, quote, I've been repeatedly assured that the rules were not broken. And again, quote, I've been repeatedly assured that no rules were broken. Now, these quotes which are on screen are also at pages 64 to 65 of your evidence bundle. Thank you. Mr Johnson, may I ask, did any government law officer or any member of the government legal department, such as the Attorney General, Solicitor General, or any one of the hundreds of solicitors and barristers that work for the government, did any one of those give you the assurance? Uh, thank you very much, Mr Costa. Well, uh, no, they, the short answer is no, they didn't, uh, but nor did I... Uh, seek uh, assurances from uh, from them, nor did I claim that I had, I don't think I claimed at any stage that I'd, I'd received assurances from uh, law officers or, or, or legal representatives. The people that I said, uh, that, that the people who had given me the assurances, uh, that there were uh, there were more than one, and it was on, indeed on more than one occasion. And so if would it be helpful if I, if, I, if I told you why I said that I was repeatedly well, assured? Uh, Mr Costa ask yes. his questions and then Fine. just follow the course of his question, sure. if you would. Very of interested course. to hear, of course, your full responses. Can I ask, did the head of the civil service, Simon Case, or any other career senior permanent civil servant give you these assurances? Um, well, it <laughs> follows from, uh, from, I think, from Martin Reynolds' evidence that he thought that the rules had not been... Uh, broken. Um, if you if you look at what he has to uh, to say, um, I don't I don't remember being specifically assured by uh, any uh, senior civil servant about the rules uh, or, or the guidance within uh, within Number Ten. But the the interesting thing is that uh, to the contrary, uh, nobody uh, gave me any contrary. We'll, we'll uh, come to that in a advice. moment, if we may. Thank you. In paragraph 90 of your very helpful written submission, you say that the assurances were given to you by Jack Doyle and James Slack. That's right. Their statements confirming this are on pages 70 
72 and 75 of your evidence bundle. Yeah. Now, they are both individuals you had personally appointed to the position of Director of Communications at Number 10. They were political advisers who dealt with the media. Why did you rely on an assurance from political advisers rather than, as I've mentioned, a permanent civil servant or, more importantly, a government lawyer? So here's the, here's the, an the, 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 the simple answer is that uh, when I needed to discover what had happened, whether the rules were broken, I went first, of course, or I asked first the senior advisor who was there, and that was Jack Doyle. Uh, the, the, the following uh, week, you can see that uh, Jack Doyle says that uh, he, he, he <coughs> confirms that he, he says in a WhatsApp to me, uh, I've been, you can say, I've been assured that there was no party and no rules were broken, so he says that again uh, to me. Uh, I also then rang James Slack, uh, who, and, and both Jack and, uh, and, and, and James Slack are people I have the utmost regard for, uh, and I believe they would be completely straight with me about what had happened, and they both said uh, that the rules had not been broken. And the, the, the reason I didn't ask a, a lawyer or another senior civil servant was because they were the people who'd been there. And they were the direct. They, they, they could give a, a view about the legality <coughs> of uh, of that event that uh, I did. I didn't think a, a non eyewitness would be able to do. Okay. Well, when you decided to rely on the assurances that you've referred to in the house, why did you not then discuss the assurance with the cabinet secretary Simon Case or your principal private secretary Martin Reynolds or a government lawyer? At the point at which you've been given the assurance by the individuals that you've questioned, why didn't so, you double check it with a government lawyer? F first of all, uh, Martin Reynolds, in addition to being my private, principal private secretary, uh, is a lawyer, and his view of, uh, of all the events, as you'll see from his evidence, is that uh, he believes that we followed the, uh, the rules at all times, and that was certainly what he, he said to me. Uh, you, you'll see evidence... Uh, Mr. Costa, from the uh, from the from uh, from my submission, that uh, at least a couple of of MP colleagues remember from the morning meeting uh, that I asked generally, uh, did we follow the rules? Were there parties? And the the view of the assembled civil servants and uh, uh, advisors was that no, we uh, no, we we hadn't uh, broken the rules, and and, the, the and, and that's what they said. The MPs that you're referring to are the ones at paragraph 90 of your written submission where you state that the evidence given to us by Sarah Dines MP and Andrew Griffith MP saying officials gave you assurances at your daily office meetings. Those are the additional assurances that you're referring to. Yes, and it's not clear what uh, date that um, uh, Sarah and Andrew uh, remember, but they certainly remember me receiving those assurances. And don't, don't forget, if I could just make an important point, from the, uh, from the 7th to, to the, from the 7th of December onwards, uh, the uh, inquiry is underway. So you ask why I didn't ask uh, Simon Case. I did ask Simon Case. I asked Simon Case to conduct an inquiry. Well, I'm very grateful that you recall Sarah Dimes MP and Andrew Griffith MP uh, giving you the assurances, but... You were present at those meetings where those two MPs said sorry. that assurances no, had been given. Sorry. So, if I just may ask the question, and you can correct me if I've misunderstood the point, who were the officials who gave these assurances in this meetings that you've referred to at paragraph 90 in your written submissions? Well, I, I, I can't name the, the, these name officials. Name me one. I, 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 don't know if I, I don't know if I can. I think that... Why not? Uh, I, I think that most of them have indicated Are they don't want them themselves to be to be named. Don't want to breach their anonymity, uh, Mr. Johnson. Could you just pause and answer my question? Are you not naming these officials who you say were giving you these assurances because you can't remember who they were, or you can't remember their names, or because you don't want to name least, them because of confidentiality? There's at least one uh, advisor that I can think of that uh, who was asked not to be not to be named and uh, she would have been she would have been in the morning uh, meeting and um, 
I don't want to. Well, could you follow that up in writing through your lawyers to the inquiry, confirming the name of the individual that you recall gave you the assurance yes, that the meetings but, referred to by these but two? But if I may say so, Mr. Costa, I don't quite follow the direction of your of your questions because it's clear from what I've said that I was assured on uh, I was re assured repeatedly by. Uh, different people and on different occasions that the rules have been followed. Well, and we're trying to ascertain who these individuals were, so it would be very helpful if you could follow up with the individual okay. that you've just referred to. Now, could I ask the team to place slide nine uh, on the screens, please? Now, slide nine refers to a comment made by Mr Doyle, and that will also be found at uh, page 74 of the bundle. Mr Doyle is asked a question. Was there a discussion in this meeting, the meeting of the 8th of December 2021, whether COVID guidance was adhered to at all times? And Mr Doyle states, quote, I did not advise the Prime Minister to say this, no. So Mr Doyle says he did not discuss with you whether any gatherings had been compliant with COVID guidance. Is it correct that you received no assurances that the gathering of 18th December 2020 or any other gatherings were compliant with COVID guidance yes. as opposed to the rules? It, it, it's, uh, it's correct to say that uh, I did not, I, as far as I can uh, re remember, I didn't receive direct assurances about the uh, December the 18th event about the, the guidance. Um, but until Martin Reynolds made his point to me on the morning of the 8th, uh, nobody had said to me anything adverse about our following of the guidance. And it was my impression uh, from what we were doing, from my lived experience Excuse in me, number 10, I'm that we were. I'd like to ascertain about assurances that you've been given. So I'm giving you the, I'm giving the answer. So let me carry on, if I may, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Can I ask you to uh, turn to pages 70? and 73 of your evidence bundle, and you'll see excerpts from Mr Doyle's signed witness submission. Now, Mr Doyle says, and I quote, the lines that were drafted for the mirror, that's the Daily Mirror, it became the basis of Mr Johnson's lines to take in Prime Minister's questions on the 1st of December 2021, end quote. He also says in relation to a conversation he had with you on the 30th of November, quote, I said that we have had an inquiry from the Daily Mirror. He said, what is our line? End quote. Page 76 of your evidence bundle shows the line sent to the Mirror was, quote, COVID rules were followed at all times. End quote. So that line, Mr Johnson, the assurance that you relied on in the House of Commons on the 8th of December was initially developed as no more than a media line to hold at Bay Press inquiries, wasn't it? Yes, but I don't see any great vice in that. And I think we have to be absolutely realistic about how government is carried on. And if uh, a minister cannot rely on the uh, advice of senior and trusted officials uh, when uh, you have to get a huge amount of business done, okay. then it I would be impossible for Mr. government Johnson, to carry on. Could I ask you to, um, uh, you've acknowledged that it was developed as a media line to hold the, 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 at bay the press inquiries. So I think we need to hear from Mr Costa his next question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it is the case, isn't it, that Jack Doyle the person whose purported assurance you sought to rely on was himself doubtful about the compliance of some of these gatherings with the rules and guidance. Now, Mr. Johnson... Oh, sorry, well, I don't know. Where, 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 well, like, when do you derive that? Just I'm going to help you. I'm going to help Mr. you. If you turn to page 79 of your evidence bundle... Saying he said this at the time. If you turn to page 79 of your evidence bundle you will see a selection of WhatsApp messages sent by Mr Doyle. These messages are discussing the gathering of the 19th of June 2020 that marked your birthday. 
Mr. Doyle says that he was, and I quote, struggling to come up with a way that the gathering was in the rules and that he was, quote, not sure it would, quote, work to suggest it was reasonably necessary for work purposes. Were you aware, Mr. Johnson, that your trusted senior advisor, as you've put it, Mr. Doyle, doubted whether this gathering was within the rules? So, uh, no, is the answer to that question. I wasn't aware that he'd sent that WhatsApp. He didn't send it to me. This was, I think, on January the 25th, uh, which is um, long after uh, we've started the the process which was to become the Sue Gray. I think the Sue Gray inquiry was already well underway. A couple of other quick points, if I may, uh, on uh, that, that WhatsApp. Um, Jack was not at that event on the 19th of June uh, 2020. Uh, he knew nothing about what had actually taken place. He was then relying on media descriptions of that event, uh, which had subsequently emerged, and Yes, uh, he sent a, a, a message to uh, someone else uh, saying he needed to work out uh, what the, the justification was. But just to go back to the, to the June the 19th event, 2020, which we've been over several times, at the time, I thought it was so innocent uh, that uh, it, was, it, it was actually briefed out to, to the I time. I appreciate that, but I want to know, I'm talking about assurances you were given, so let me focus again. So how can it be that Mr Doyle, and this is the, the point I think is important for the inquiry to understand, how can it be that Mr Doyle, one of your principal advisors, your trusted advisor, the person whose assurance you relied on in the House of Commons, was himself clearly doubtful about the compliance of this gathering with the rules, but you continue to say that you were not. How can that be? He, he wasn't at that event. Uh, he was struggling to uh, contend with media accounts of it long after that event and after the, uh, the Sue Gray inquiry had already begun. And above all, he did not even at that time, let alone before I stood up in the House of Commons, raise with me any concerns that he might have had about that event. Thank you. Even if he knew about it. I'm almost finished, Mr Johnson. Why did you tell the House of Commons that you had received repeated assurances that no rules had been broken when you knew that that was not the case because you knew what the rules were? You were at gatherings that breached the rules. And the breaches of the rules would have been obvious to you at the time. That's, Isn't that's, that the case? No, that's, sorry. Let that, complete the question, well, if you may. Some might see your reliance on sorry. the purported assurances you, you received as, and forgive me, as a deflection mechanism to prevent having to answer questions about your knowledge of these gatherings. Would that not be a fair assessment? No, it would be a completely ridiculous assessment. Uh, I said in the... Uh, in the in the Commons on the uh, on the eighth of uh, December, uh, that I'd been re repeatedly assured uh, that there was no party and that uh, no rules were broken. Uh, I was referring to the December the uh, the twentieth, sorry, eighteenth event, the December the eighteenth event of the previous year of, of twenty twenty. Um, I had the assurances that I had received about that event. Uh, were from people that I had the utmost respect for and who were directly relevant to my understanding of, of what that event consisted of. It was entirely sensible to talk both to Jack uh, and then Jack Doyle and then to James Slack to find out, to get their honest take about what had happened. And my impression on the 30th of November 2020 from what Jack was telling me uh, was that it sounded like it was in accordance with the rules, it sounded like it was necessary for, for work purposes, uh, but also it sounded from what he was saying that it was in accordance with the guidance. When that turned out, following the Allegra video uh, to be in question, I commissioned Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, to conduct an inquiry. So by the time I... Uh, so, and if you look at that statement, uh, I say I've, I've been repeatedly assured that there was no party and that the, uh, the rules were, were followed, but I have asked Simon Case 
to investigate. So for the purposes of the House, my, my statement, uh, it should be seen in the, for the purposes of the business of the House, that statement should be seen in the context of the investigation, the inquiry that I have just launched, in which in the same PMQs, I say I'm going to uh, make sure that the findings are placed in the Library of the House of Commons. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for answering my questions this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Could I just uh, put a, a point to you? Because um, I, along with my colleagues, was in the House at the time when these assurances were given. And we took them to be serious assurances. You told the House you'd receive assurances. Would you not expect us to be a bit dismayed to hear that it was not from the senior civil servants, it was from political appointees, that they themselves had doubts about it. They don't only count, it's the it only covered one gathering, it didn't cover the other three, and it only covered the rules, it didn't cover the guidance. I think if you'd have said that to us in the House, and also you were there at the time, so it's a bit hard to understand. I, I was, I, sorry. Could you let me finish my sorry, point? You were there at the time, so it's a bit hard to understand what the nature of an assurance is when you have been there and seen it with your own eyes. I mean, if, if I was going at 100 miles an hour and I saw the speedometer saying 100 miles an hour, it would be a bit odd, wouldn't it, if I said somebody assured me that I wasn't, because it's what you've seen with your own eyes. Yeah, with great so respect. do you actually think that we're a bit, we would be entitled to be a bit dismayed about the flimsy yeah. nature of this assurance when we took it at face value that these assurances amounted to something and it looks from what you've told us in answer to Mr. Coss's questions that they did not amount to much at all. No, so, so first, first of all, I think, of great respect, Chair, uh, if you're talking about the December the 18th, 2020 event, I don't know, there's some confusion. I was not there. Uh, That's one of the three. I, I was three not there. you were there. And if you look at the statement that I made in the House of Commons, and because this was the relevant issue, because the Allegra video related to the December the 18th event, uh, the, the leader of the opposition's questions the previous week related to the December the 18th event, I was answering about the December the 18th event, because that was the, the matter in, in question. I had received, as I said, repeated assurances by different people and at uh, a different, more than one occasion and more than one person, uh, that the event was uh, in accordance with the rules. And I had that both from, uh, as I said, Jack Doll and James Slack. Now, the, the, the question that I, I think the committee is trying to, to, to unpick is, is that a good enough assurance? Is it good enough to rely on the Director of Communications and the former Director of Communications no, no, about one event, no matter how eminent uh, th they may be? And I think the answer is yes. He himself had doubts. I think, no, sorry, uh, forgive me. Uh, he offered, that, 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 that's not correct, uh, Chair. Uh, the Director of Communications, Jack Doyle, did not say at the time that he briefed me about the December the 18th event that he had doubts about whether the guidance was he followed. He did have doubts. Can I just no, ask Sorry, sorry, Mr. sorry, where, 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 where's, your, where's your evidence for that? It's in the WhatsApp. Oh, so Bernard is going to continue this question. Sorry, can I just say, he did not express those doubts to me. No, he did I'm not express those doubts to me. He had doubts. The person whose assurances you were relying you can, you can on only gave assurances in, in relation to one gathering, not the others. Only gave assurances of the rules, not about COVID. It was Chair, relying Chair, I was being the asked media. about the one gathering. The, the leader of the opposition, you, you played his clip just now. That was, everybody saw it. He was asking about, he said, what, was there a party in which loads of people came uh, uh, to a Christmas party in Downing Street last year? That was the question. Uh, that was then, uh, when I said that the guidance was followed completely at all times, that was then called into question by what Allegra uh, Stratton had to say. Uh, so uh, we immediately instituted the uh, inquiry by, by Simon Case, but that remained the point at issue. The point at issue was what had happened on December the 18th. And really, if the, if the, if the committee is going to say that I can't rely uh, on the advice of senior p people uh, like uh, Jack Doll and, and James Slack, who had the advantage of actually being there, then it's really going to make it very difficult for government to be carried on. Um, Mr. Johnson, just two points arising from when you're ready. 
two points arising from uh, the recent questions and answers. First of all, on the question of uh, Sarah Dine's um, statement of evidence, uh, where she um, mentions that either on the 1st of December or the 8th of December, uh, she recalls, are you asking, we did follow the rules at all times, didn't we? And this is in your um, paragraph 90 of your submission. And I recall more than one person in the room said, yes, of course. And she says, I'm not certain who the people were, but I, and I quote, I'm 90% sure one of them was Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and um, uh, the difficulty we have with that evidence is in the sworn statement from Simon Case, which I'm afraid is not in the um, call bundle, but it's on page 33. Oh, it's uh, on uh, 791 and 792 of the general bundle. And um, don't waste time fumbling for it because I will explain. Uh, he's asked about both these meetings, um, and he makes it clear that there was no dis was there discussion in the meeting of the following points, and if so, what were the details of that discussion? Uh, he says, I do not believe any of these to topics were discussed at the meeting. And he's asked a general question on 793. Are you aware of any other meeting where Mr. Johnson was present, where the points listed in parts E and F were discussed, and that's whether there was any discussion about um, compliance with the guidance and rules? And he says no. Um, so we have a difficulty um, giving any credibility to the evidence we've received uh, from uh, Sarah Dines, albeit I'm sure she gave that evidence in good faith. Um, uh, then there's the question of your reliance on, I mean, have you got anything to say about that? I should give you the opportunity. Well, uh, I, I, I think if you're going to question her evidence, then, then you, you, you need to hear it from from her, I, I can't. I can't, I can't well, comment. Fair, I can't comment on her. No, I can't comment on her evidence. I can't comment on what uh, Simon Case has said. Yeah. What I, what I, what I, what I, what I do remember uh, are uh, general affirmation uh, from uh, from colleagues that uh, it was the line I was about to use in PMQs that uh, the about the rules uh, being followed <laughs> was was supported. But do you remember Simon yeah. Case? Saying, frankly, yes, uh, frankly, I, 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 so, I, I don't. Mean, but I'm, I'm not questioning. But, I, but you should ask him. I'm not questioning the no, veracity. We're you I'm, because I'm not, you were there. I'm not questioning the veracity of her statement as she believes it, because she is quite open. She says she's only 90% no, sure. Look, she's not sure. But I, sorry, but I wasn't relying okay. uh, for, for, for what I said on, I mean, if, on if the cabinet. I think secretary. it's terribly important that we interrogate Sarah Dines, we will consider No, I don't think, point. I don't. I, I, I think it's probably totally irrelevant. Yeah. I think that the key point is that when I said that I'd had repeated assurances, uh, I was not. Okay. I, I never claimed that I had one of those uh, yeah, people then, giving me those assurances was Simon another, Case. Okay, but there's another more general point. You say I see no great vice in that. That is relying on the assurance of Mr. Doyle, who was a, an appointed political advisor, not uh, a professional civil servant, uh, uh, not an impartial. Like, like Sugre. Um, well, we're not relying on Sugre's evidence uh, right. in this okay. uh, inquiry. Um, uh, it, the obligation not to mislead Parliament is a very serious obligation <coughs> on any member of Parliament, let alone a minister. And it requires the MP or the minister to take due care, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. So if I'm, I have to say, if I was accused of law-breaking um, and I had to give undertakings to the House of Commons of all places that I had not broken the law, I would want the advice of a lawyer. I would want the advice of somebody really independent and capable. And you didn't ask the Cabinet Secretary. Can I, just, can, I pop, can I interrupt you for 10 seconds? Yes. Uh, I wasn't accused of law-breaking. I was asked to say uh, what had gone on uh, at a party yeah. okay. uh, or an event in up, the media room on the okay, 18th the of December 2020. Advice. If I was asked to give undertakings that rules and guidance had been followed and, and there was any doubt about it, there was the most thinnest scintilla of doubt about it, well, you'd want to copper plate your assurances by showing that you'd taken proper advice. Perhaps and I, can I put it to you, Mr. Johnson, you did not take proper advice. Can I, can I, well, can I respond first by saying that uh, if you look at what I said on uh, December the 1st, you have to, uh, it, it is true, as Mr. Carter said, that uh, I had expected something like that question to, to come up. But actually, 
I thought that the leader of the opposition would not bother uh, with that story uh, okay, for his main line of questions. That's irrelevant. Uh, it, it is relevant. The question is, why did you not take proper sorry. advice? Sorry, sorry, sorry. The, 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 the answer is, quite simply, that over the... And I've, tr I've tried to describe what I felt about these events as they were happening. Nobody raised with me yeah. uh, or, uh, or had any concern before I stood up on, 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 on uh, December the 1st uh, about those events. You did not ask. I asked. I did. See, this is you complete ask. nonsense. I mean, complete nonsense. I asked the relevant people. They were senior people. They'd been working very hard. They gave, uh, Jack Doyle gave me a clear account of what had happened. the Cabinet Secretary. I, the, how the cabinet secretary okay, wasn't there? And I, and, sorry, here you're wrong because I did ask the cabinet secretary. And I, I, like, I did ask the cabinet secretary to conduct an inquiry no, on no, the seventh no, of December. No, not about whether your undertakings to the House of Commons were correct. But of course, um, that was what I he think was. We can move on. Um, can we turn to Charles Walker uh, for our next questions? Um, sorry, there's some noises coming from the back of the room. Is is that stopped? Okay. Uh, Mr. Johnson, housekeeping matters. You're a parliamentarian, I'm a parliamentarian, so we do have a duty to Parliament. There's been a lot of noises of hue and cry about the uh, legitimacy of, of this inquiry, which I do think we need to address. You sort of alluded to it in your opening statement. I'll just give you an example of an organisation that claims to have uh, your interests at heart. It's called Conservative Post. Uh, it, in a recent article published on its website on the 12th of March, it stated, this was the headline, revealed the Privileges Committee's Great British Stitch-Up of Boris. And the sentence is, so when Labour proposed referring Boris Johnson to the Privileges Committee for misleading Parliament... Many Conservative MPs didn't oppose it. Now, I just want to park that for a second and take you back about 11 months before that. On the 21st of April, when uh, your case was referred to the Privileges Committee, the Government Minister, the Right Honourable Michael Ellis QC, the then Minister for the Cabinet Office and Paymaster General, said the following in winding up. The government recognised the seriousness of the issue under consideration. Let me say at the outset that the Prime Minister has always been clear that he is happy to face whatever inquiries Parliament sees fit to hold. He is happy for the House to decide how it wishes to proceed today. And, and this is important because... Because, because at the end, of, at the end of, of that, the motion was put, and there was no vote. And that is a, a matter of, mm. of fact. In, indeed, there wasn't even a cry of object from anyone. Can you accept that was the case? Yes, I, 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 I encourage people to, to support it. So, so it, it is actually misleading of Conservative Post to say... Many Conservative MPs didn't oppose it. The truth is, not a single, not a single Conservative MP opposed it. Yes, uh, that's uh, completely correct. That's uh, great. No, no, this is really good. This is good. We're making progress. In your opening statement, you referred to the, the chair, uh, the appointment of the chair. You suggest, to, to some extent, um, that you, know, you had concerns, but you, sh you, you were willing to set those concerns aside. On the 14th of June, 2022, the Right Honourable Lady for Camberwell and Peckham, um, there was a motion to add her to the committee on the 14th of June, 2022. And um, it went through at the end of a debate on the privatisation of Channel 4, and there were colleagues of ours in the chamber, and when uh, the motion was put and the on Right Honourable Lady's name was mentioned, there was not a single cry of object, not one, not even from a little mouse scuttling across the floor, not a single cry of object on the 14th of June. Can you accept that as well? Uh, of course. So if these concerns were, were live about the, the committee and, and our legitimacy or the legitimacy of the chair, somebody might have shouted object. I, I would listen. Okay. Uh, so, 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 Charles, can I just... 
come back quickly on this on this point. Uh, my my anxieties about uh, fairness uh, are contained in my uh, submission. Uh, the, uh, I've said what I've had to say about the previous remarks of the chair, uh, and and I've said what I had to say about my belief in uh, the ability of this committee, which is a very important and distinguished committee, uh, to be impartial. Which were made for her appointment and, on the fourteenth. And I uh, have come before you this, this afternoon. Uh, in full confidence that you will be impartial and that you will look at the evidence and that you will conclude uh, that I did not wittingly or recklessly uh, mislead Parliament. There's not a shred of evidence to suggest that I did. Uh, and I hope that you will exonerate me, uh, and I think you should exonerate me, of any contempt, whatever. So, so look, I'm, 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 we received your evidence bundle, which was really well put together. It's been a long afternoon. We've shared the talking. You've had to do it on your own. So, so, so thank you for answering our questions. But... It is a well put together bundle. I just feel that the, the, the way things have been conducted is, is, is that your supporters, I'm not saying you, I'm saying your supporters seem to want it both ways. They're hoping that the evidence you've given in 52 pages will exonerate you, given, give you a clean bill of health. And that's what the, your desired outcome is. But just in case that doesn't happen, there has been a concerted effort to, to delegitimise the committee, to call us a kangaroo court. Have you characterised us as, as a kangaroo court? You, you can tell by my presence this afternoon, by the uh, seriousness with which I've taken uh, your questions, uh, by my attempts to answer in detail uh, what you, the points you've, you've put to me, how seriously I take you and your committee, uh, the respect I have for this institution of Parliament, and. For better or worse, whatever the, 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 the issues of fairness that I, I may have raised in my submission, this is the body that decides on uh, standards and privileges. This is the committee that does it. There's no other way of doing it. That's why I have come here, out of respect for the committee, out of respect for Parliament, and because I do not believe that you can conceivably find me guilty of wittingly misleading Parliament on the basis of the evidence that you have assembled. So as, as a parliamentarian, do you regret that colleagues of ours, who are also parliamentarians, have called the Privileges Committee a kangaroo court? Look, I, I don't want uh, anybody to uh, cause uh, any colleague, any, uh, uh, there, should be no, there should be no intimidation or uh, there should be no uh, attempt to bully any colleague in any matter, whatever. Or is that a yes or a no? But you yes. But you, you regret. You regret that they... Sorry, I, I, I'm not... Because I I'm regret not, it. I'm, I'm, I'm not... As a look, parliamentarian, so, do so you regret my, it? My, my questions of fairness are uh, well documented in uh, my submission. Uh, I think that the... the uh, I, I, don't, I, I deprecate the term that you've just used. I don't want to uh, repeat it. But I think the people will judge for themselves on the basis of the evidence that you have produced... Uh, 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 on the fairness of this committee. I have every confidence that you will uh, show that you can be fair. OK, I'm, 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 nearly, I'm nearly done. Can I just interject, yeah. if I may, Chair? Will you accept that this committee can be fair and wrong rather than being f unfair and a witch hunt? Um, I, I, I certainly think that... Let me put it this way, Mr Costa. I think if this committee were to find me... Uh, in contempt of Parliament, uh, uh, having, which would be uh, having come and done something so utterly insane uh, and contrary to uh, my, my beliefs and, uh, and my principles is to come here, uh, to come to Parliament and wittingly uh, lie, I think that would be not only unfair, I think it would be wrong. But indeed, but you wouldn't categorise it as a witch hunt or a kangaroo court. That's the well, point I'm I mean, asking. I, I, I think you... Doesn't uh, you, I, I would wait to see how you proceed with the evidence uh, okay. that you have, but I, 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 do not, I do not wish to. Uh, you know, I, I will study. I will study your conclusions uh, from the evidence. I deprecate the terms that you have used. I don't want to see uh, good, good colleagues feeling that they're under pressure. Either way, I believe that uh, if you study this evidence impartially, uh, you will come to the conclusion that. Uh, that, I've, okay. that I've given. Nearly, nearly done. Um, on the 25th of May, you described number 10, and here are the speech marks, a building that is 5,300 metres square across five floors, excluding the flats, 
hundreds of staff are entitled to work there. And I'm really sorry, I think this is probably the last time you're going to be taken back to these dates. On the 1st of December, you will be well aware that you said to the Leader of the Opposition, all guidance was followed completely in number 10. On the 8th of December, again to the Leader of the Opposition, you said, I have been repeatedly assured that the rules were not broken, and then I'll, I'll rattle through this quickly. On the 8th of December to Catherine West, um, it, regarding uh, 13th of November alleged party, I'm sure whatever happened, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. I, you, re you received assurances from a number of people. I suppose the question I've got is uh, how on earth would they have known that the okay. rules were being, were being followed at all times? It is impossible because you, you didn't have cameras in every room. No, no. I mean, well, but, no, but I had their pairs of eyes. Yep. So you're right. So I didn't have omniscience about what was going on in the building. And I had to rely on what people told me. You're completely right, Sir Charles. But uh, what they had to say was extremely valuable and they were extremely reputable people and are extremely reputable people. And they gave a description of, of that event. And, it, and to get back to the point that the chair was raising, uh, initially it was, it was one event that was under consideration, under discussion. And um, I took my, my cue from them. So I, I want to say this, because I th you worked incredibly hard. I accept you worked incredibly hard. I accept your officials worked incredibly hard. I accept that you were hospitalized. Um, we got the vaccines out. You worked incredibly hard. I, I suppose what I'm left with, and I'm, I'm not sure if this helps or hinders your case, is, is when you look at 126 fixed penalty notice, notices yeah. handed out to number 10, it is clear that Simon Case, Martin Reynolds, Jack Doyle, Lee Kane, James Slack, all of them really had no idea what was going on because if they had, it is highly unlikely 126 fixed penalty notices would have been handed out. And can I, can I just say, Sir Charles, that you put your finger on the crucial point? Uh, because uh, if the, the committee thinks that uh, I must have known, or to get back to the conversation we've had, the doctrine of obviousness, uh, if, if it was obvious to me, then it would have been obvious to those other senior and distinguished people. It, it, it really wasn't. And I was... Very shocked to get my own FPN uh, and um, amazed, frankly, by the number of other FPNs. Uh, clearly what happened, uh, you know, if we, we don't want to go over it again, we don't want to reinvestigate, but I think what happened basically was that on a few uh, evenings, events did simply go on far too long. And I can't apologise for that enough, uh, but so we are where we are. So I don't want to try, try, try your patience, because you have been here a long time if, if not deliberate if not deliberate is it possible that it was reckless or slightly reckless not to have caveated your your statements to the house with you know to the to the best to the best of my knowledge or i, I really do hope it was it was the certainty of the statement so yeah, yeah. is it possible to accept that actually um, there was a degree of, 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 of recklessness. No, I mean, no one, nobody wants to be in a position where they're misleading that. Nobody wants to, to say something to the House of Commons that is going to be, turn out not to be true, especially something as readily falsifiable as the guidance was followed completely. It was, it was my belief that that was the case. I, I uh, have apologised and I, uh, I continue to apologise for, uh, for inadvertently uh, misleading that and, and 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 I hope the the committee understands that. Uh, but it was it was it was not deliberate. It was based on my genuine understanding and, and uh, belief about what we were doing, what we had been doing for a long time. And, it, and I think that your your point just now was 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 the, one of the most important ones in this whole business. Uh, it it wasn't obvious to me uh, that there were problems with some events, and it wasn't obvious to uh, the other senior people that you've described. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to finally explore the question of the correcting the record issue, because there's been a lot of discussion about you having corrected the record. And I just want to explore one aspect of that and put this to you. What you said on the 25th of May, 2022, you said, 
I'm happy to set on the record now that when I came to this House and said in all sincerity that the rules and guidance had been followed at all times, it was what I believed to be true. And you've said that to us this afternoon. You then go on to say, it was certainly the case that when I was present at gatherings to wish staff farewell. So what you said to the House, by way of a purported correction, was that it was certainly the case when you were present at gatherings to wish staff farewell that the guidance had been followed at all times. Do you want to reassert that or do you want to correct the record and acknowledge here um, that actually the guidance was not followed at all times, just so we're clear, because you can correct the record to this committee. So what I want to say is, first of all, that the rules were followed, and that's for my I'm asking period at the, the uh, those events, and that's I'm clear from the FPN. And it was, my, it was my belief uh, at the time that I made those statements uh, that the guidance was followed, and actually, uh, Chair, it remains my belief. For the time, the time I was there, the uh, when, when, I was, when I was looking at these events, uh, I thought they were within the guidance, given what I knew about what we were trying to do, given what I knew about the limitations we faced on uh, maintaining yeah, perfect social distancing. We're asking now about and so, what your belief is now. So what I, I don't what, wish to dissent from what I said on May uh, the 25th. Well, May the 25th was five months after this had first been raised, um, and you'd had time to consider all the issues that were being raised, and even further time has elapsed till here we are now, and there's a lot of evidence that's been produced and you've had the opportunity to consider. Do you still want to assert that it was certainly the case when you were present at gatherings to wish staff farewell that the guidance had been followed at all times. Do you want to assert yes, that I do. to this committee? Yes, I, I do. And, and I, what I, what I, what I, what I want to make, I, I do, and because I, don't, I see no reason to withdraw what I said on, on May the, the 25th, uh, because at that stage, uh, on May the 25th, I was in possession of, and I think the, 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 the committee in the, the, possibly the world was, it was uh, in possession of all the um, uh, um, material that we've looked at uh, today, uh, my view remains that the guidance allowed for social distancing not to be carried out with uh, rigid uh, drill sergeant uh, precision, particularly in difficult circumstances such as the ones in which we were operating, provided you had mitigations. Okay, and so you. that, that was my, that was my you are belief sticking, and it remains. You're sticking with that point and you don't wish to I don't. make a correction of the record. Thank you. Um, that concludes our questions. Um, are there any final points that you haven't already mentioned? Not ones that you have mentioned, but ones which you would like to mention which haven't come up in our questions. Well, I mean, yeah, We'd like to give the, you the opportunity I, I, to I, make those points. Thank you, thank you very much. I've, I, I've much enjoyed our discussion. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I think it's been a useful, I genuinely think it's been a useful discussion. And I hope it's clear to the committee uh, what was in my heart and my mind on uh, December the 1st and uh, December the 8th of um, 2021. And May the 25th and numerous and other occasions. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Thank the committee you. will consider the evidence you've given us alongside the other evidence we've re reviewed in the course of our inquiries. We may take further written and or oral evidence before the end of our inquiry and before we reach our final conclusions, if we deem that necessary, and we've already discussed the possibility of that. But for now, that concludes our session today. Order, order. Thank you.